Go ahead. All right, good evening. Uh, before I call to order this meeting, I have a few things I'd like to say. Uh, we've been receiving a lot of your emails and concerns over getting the kids back to school phone in person. Some of these emails have been supportive of our efforts and we appreciate that. However, we've also received a number of emails that are mean and nasty. People accuse us of not being transparent, of not making enough effort to get the kids back in school full time, and of not caring that the kids are suffering both mentally and academically. We had one parent write and ask us, when are we gonna start putting the children first? While we welcome feedback from our community, a number of the emails that we have received the last couple of months have been simply unacceptable. We as a committee spend countless hours in business meetings, subcommittee meetings, and meetings with district administrative staff. We spend hours reading DESI and mass guidance and news articles. We speak with our neighboring communities. In addition to our bi-monthly meetings, there's a lot of work being done behind the scenes. And, and I assure you, all of this work is being done for the purpose of one goal, and that is what is in the best interest of the students. In addition to being school committee members amongst us, we are also parents of 12 children currently attending the school. We know you're frustrated and worried about your children. We all are. But lashing out and accusing the administration and the school committee of not making any decisions is not helpful and is simply not true. We've been doing our best with everything that has been thrown at us over the last year and have had to make countless hard decisions, decisions that not one of us thought we would ever have to make, and we will continue to do so. Charlie Baker and the commissioner Riley announced today that they're gonna be loosening the restrictions that have been placed on public schools and calling to have elementary students back to school five days a week, hopefully by April with the middle and high school students to follow. This is great news and we will be working with the administration to do this the best and safest way for our children. One other thing I wanna mention before we start, we have community members and school committee members complaining about the length of our meetings and that Robert's rules are sometimes not followed. Going forward, I would like to make, I would. I will be making my best effort to follow these rules and keep the meetings on track with relevant conversations. When a topic is being discussed, I will call on each member to weigh in. Once everyone who wants to speak has spoken, members will have one more chance to speak and that will be that. that is, that's Robert's rules. Uh, and lastly, words cannot express the tremendous grief our community is experiencing over the tragic loss of one of our Pentucket parents, Kate Sherwood, who passed away suddenly last week. She was an incredible mother to her two young boys, loving soulmate to her husband, a well-respected high school counselor, avid school and PTO volunteer, and an amazing caring friend to all she met. Please join me in a moment of silence to send positive thoughts and healing to her family and many friends in the community who are grieving. Thank you. And with that, I would like to call to order the February 23rd business meeting of the Pentucket Regional School District. Roll call, Wayne Adams. Yes, yes. Joanna Blanchard. Here. Emily Dwyer. Here. Marie Felzani. Here. Dick Hodges. Here. Lisa O'Connor. Here. Chris Markins. Here. Chris Redding. Here. And Dina Trotta here. Full house today. Okay. Sorry, I real quick. I know there's, there's people trying to get into the public comment. If they could just, what we have with one, two, three, or just with many, many of the school committee members not able to be here in person, we restricted how people be in the studio. So I know we have three public speakers in the studio right now. If they could stay there, and once they're done, once someone's done, if you're watching this, you'll be able to come on in and do public comment. Um, so again, just if you're trying to get in, it, we have to, you have to wait until someone speaks before uh, another person is able to get in. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, could I get a motion to approve tonight's agenda? So moved. Second. Roll call vote. Uh, Tina, can uh, I make a, Tina. Uh, oh, discussion. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I sort of wanted to put it to the group really quickly. I don't know that this will be necessary at all. I, um, given this, the developments from today, did we want to give ourselves the option if the superintendent needed anything from us, um, specifically on the uh, COVID-related matters, to 
approve anything if you needed something from us. Currently, I think it's just discuss. Uh, I didn't know if you wanted to consider changing to discuss approve, just to give ourselves the option. Justin, is there anything you would like are going to need from us? Do you think? So I, I'll, I'll be presenting a plan. I, I think it, it, the plan we, we described what we were going to do. I put it down in writing. So the next steps and, and part of like I started making adjustments based on what was happening today uh, to that plan. So uh, I mean we can we can approve it at the next meeting, but I, I'll go I can go over it today, or we don't need to approve it at all. If, if, when we get there, I mean, obviously, I think a lot of us are excited about what that kind of might be. So, um, when we get to that point, I might be able to just go ahead and implement it, or we can review and get the approval. But a lot of it fits into what we had approved back in August. Chris, you have a question? Well, um, kind, of, kind of a comment um, that if we put it as discuss approve and we find the need to have an approval, then it's there. If we don't have approval on there, then we can't do any kind of vote during that. Item, so I'm just, but if it says approved and there's nothing to actually vote on, then that's fine. Like, I think adding it makes more sense than not having it there just in case. Yeah, I guess it struck me as a no harm, no foul situation. Right. Okay. I mean, we have to vote on it. So, roll call vote. Wayne? Yes. Joanna? Yes. Emily? Yes. Marie? Dick. Yes. Lisa. Yes. Chris Markins. Yes. Chris Redding. Yes. Dina Trotta. Yes. Okay, that is to add, discuss, to approve to item B of new business. Uh, do we now have to approve the agenda or did, is that just what we approved it with the change, correct? Okay. All right, could I please have a motion to approve the finance subcommittee meeting minutes from February 9th, 2021? Second. Any discussion? Okay. Uh, Wayne? Yes. Joanna? Yes. Emily? Yes. Marie? Yes. Dick? Yes. Lisa? Yes. Chris Markins? Yes. Chris Redding? Yes. And Dina, yes. Uh, could I have a motion to accept and file all correspondence? So moved. Second. Second. Do I have any discussion? Okay. Wayne? Yes. Joanna? Yes. Emily? Yes. Marie? Yes. Dick? Yes. Lisa? Yes. Chris Markins? Yes. Chris Redding? Yes. Dina Trotta? Yes. Great. Uh, could I please have an update on the finance subcommittee? Um, we came in over, well, I guess before vacation to sign warrants. Um, and I believe we're going to actually try to meet next week. Um, earlier in the day to sign warrants and also kind of go over some of the adjustments that Greg is going to be recommending at the school committee meeting next week um, with regard to the budget. So I think that will kind of help us kind of get an understanding before it's presented to the full committee next Tuesday night. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, Emily, teaching, learning, and accountability up update. Nothing new to report. Thank you. Uh, policy, Marie. Uh, we met on February 12th, and we're going to meet again this Friday, um, February 26th. And in the next agenda packet, we'll have some approved policies for the meeting of the school board. Okay, great. Uh, Chris, superintendent evaluate. Oh, wait, sorry, bylaws. Um, we have not met since the next meeting, and we have to schedule that. So that would be the bylaws update. <laughs> um, superintendent evaluation, Chris. Um, I, I don't even remember when we met, but we met. <laughs> um, and I think we're meeting again next Monday. I have a draft of the items that our subcommittee decided on um, from the full rubric, whittle it down to correspond with um, Dr. Bartholomew's goals. So I'll present that to the subcommittee and hopefully we'll have it ready to distribute in April so that we can get it back before there's any changes on the committee 
um, in May. Great, thanks. And uh, communications, please. Um, I don't think we've met. So mm -hmm. we have the new rollout of the website, which appears to be working very well. Okay, great. Um, all right, and now we have public comment. I just want to remind everyone that you have three minutes and um, Dr. B, you'll have to announce who it is. And please state your name and the town you're, you're from. Thank you. Right, so, so again, the way this will work, because uh, we don't have three public comment people in the studio at one time, we'll have first Patrick Kelly. Patrick will be followed by Vincent Cutright, and he'll be followed by uh, Charlotte Cantone. And after Charlotte, we you know, I know people are trying to get in, I can see people trying to get in. Yeah, so uh, we have Sarah Perry, Joel Boslin, uh, and Ashley Tracy, who will be followed. So we'll open up with uh, Mr. Kelly. And Mr. Kelly, you are now in the studio. Good evening. My name is Patrick Kelly, and I'm a Merrimack resident and the father of a current kindergarten student at the Spencer Elementary School. I'll be reading a statement this evening on behalf of my wife, who had to attend a wake unexpectedly. Kimberly is a first grade teacher within the Wilmington public school system, and I am the principal of Triton High School. We both deeply understand the challenges that have been placed upon all school teaching groups this year. Thank you for all that you have done and are currently doing to support the Pentucket School District. Within our family, we're trying our best to focus on the positives of this year. However, as educators, Kim and I are bound to the hours of the school day with no room for flexibility. For this reason, we contacted the Sweetser Elementary School last March to ensure that we would be able to enroll our son William in the before and after school program. When we learned that the program would not be running, we were fortunate enough to find a college student who was home for the semester to help William on and off the school bus on his in-person school day. The program that Triton Public Schools is providing to their employees has also been an integral support for our family on William's asynchronous school days. Unfortunately, we recently lost our childcare for William's in-person school days as he returned to college for the spring semester like many other college students. I appreciate a before school option is on the agenda this evening. However, I was taken aback by the phrasing, a place to drop their children in the morning, and this will be a simple keep safe space, and students need to bring something to pass the time. Our youngest learners deserve more than sitting alone and being expected to engage independently with activities brought from home. Within Kim's classroom, she is able to safely provide fun and engaging activities for her first graders each day. A before and after school program is capable of doing the same. The Wilmington before and after school program has operated safely from the start of the school year based largely on the importance and value placed upon it by the district. What younger students and their families need is a nurturing, safe, welcoming, and engaging before and after school program. The district is already investing and what older students need through the safe operation of athletic and extracurricular programs. These programs support the physical, creative, and social emotional needs of the older students. Our youngest students deserve the same. Before and after school programs are also about equity. Every family within the Pentucket School District deserves programming that helps provide access to in-school learning. A before school option may support some families. However, other families may be more in need of after school care especially considering the information shared today by Governor Baker and Commissioner Riley, stating that all K-8 students should be back in school full time in April, it's even more imperative that the committee put in place a robust before and after school program for the remainder of this school year. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Patrick. Hi, right, Patrick, I'm gonna kick you out, nothing personal, but you're gonna get kicked out of the studio. And if someone else is waiting and can't get in, you should. They'll get in numbers. Um, so up, up now we have Vincent Cartwright. Mr. Cartwright, you are live. Oh, Mr. Cartwright. So he might be frozen. All right, well, Mr. 
you are now live. Go ahead, Mr. Tom. Uh, dear school committee members, my name is Charlotte Cantone and I live in Groveland. I have two children attending Bagnall and one child attending middle school. I am asking you today to reopen our schools. You and only you as the school committee can open the schools. The same way as you and only you voted to close Bagnall in January. We have all seen and read the science that schools with mitigations are safe, even if the rest of the community is not in great shape. It took Las Vegas 18 suicides before they reopened their school. Let us not be another Las Vegas. Let's, let us act because it's the right thing to do, not because we are forced to. Let us prioritize our students well-being over the hardship of moving furniture around. I told my seven-year-old today, they might force us to open schools as, as they won't allow the hybrid and remote learning anymore. What do you think of that? Her response was, great. However, I would like them to want to open schools rather than being forced to open. I agree with her. I want you to want to open schools because it's the right thing to do. But when I hear in meetings about issues like moving furniture, it doesn't make me feel the will is there. Uh, talking about furniture being an issue is disrespectful to all students in Pent of Pentucket. They deserve more than that. They deserve you being brave and asking questions and questioning the answers you're getting. Why aren't we able to open when multiple schools in Massachusetts and the US are already open? The answer is you as a school board haven't opened our schools yet. There is no magic event that will happen. It's up to you and only you to make the decision. Thank you. Thank you, Charlotte. Thank you, Ms. Canton. And now anyone else who is uh, Anyone else that's waiting to speak? I know I saw Mr. Cartwright go in and out, so we're waiting on Sarah Perry, Bill McLaughlin, Vincent Cartwright, and Ashley Tracy. We see if Vincent is in again, I think. Okay, Mr. Cartwright, can you, you're good to go. Hello? No, we can hear you. Yes. Uh, good evening, school committee members and Pentuck administration. My name is Vince Cutright. I'm a Groveland resident. I have children who attend the Bagnell School. They are currently working on the recognition of 100 days of school. It is not lost on me, nor should it be lost on the committee, that they have only been to 40 days of school. For the balance of the other 60 days, one of my children takes 1.5 hours to complete remote content per day and the other 2.3 hours. This includes their live stream content. We're simply failing our children in this district. I urge you to fulfill your obligation to the children of Pentucket and move forward in person learning in a truly meaningful way. Dr. B's email to the community on February 12th referenced six feet of distancing. Please reference the committee's own meeting minutes from July 21st that state, when there's a mass break, students must be six feet apart. They must be three feet apart in class and six feet apart when eating. One cohort could have lunch in the cafeteria while the one cohort would remain in the classroom for lunch. If you do not feel we are well beyond a crisis situation for our children, you must, at a minimum, realize that each opportunity to bring children back should be moved upon swiftly. During your committee's meeting on July 21st, Dr. B states that Page School could bring everyone back at six feet and, quote, they are ready to go. Simply put, you must open the page in any single classroom in the district that can accommodate more children. I urge you to do something this evening. But with this argument of whether this is fair, none of this is equitable. We have 504 and IEP students whose services required by law are not being provided. We are fully aware with children who cannot even move to hybrid. Not opening the page is nothing to help my Bagnell kids or those children at the Sweetser and Donahue. It simply hurts the students who attend the page. Pentucket was forward thinking as compared to many neighborhood districts when we started a hybrid instead of fully remote. Conversely, Pentucket is now increasingly alone 
that we have not evolved from our original posture as district after district moves forward, bringing their students back. Sadly, our children are being left behind. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Scott Wright. So we're still waiting now if uh, Joel McLaughlin, Ashley Tracy, or Sarah Perry. Madam Chair, none of those individuals are in the studio right now. Um, so I don't know if you want to. Um, I mean, do you want to wait a minute or you could go into superintendent news and then we could go back to public comment if someone comes in? I'm okay with that. If, uh, Casey, you want Oh yeah, Casey, why don't you do your update and then we'll see if anyone shows up. Okay. Uh, hi everyone. Um, so we just had our February vacation, which could not have come at a better time. I think both the teachers and students needed that hard earned break. Um, also our fall two sports season is just now getting underway, which is another positive step as many students are getting to participate in some of their favorite sports that had previously gotten postponed. Um, as we've seen with the recent completion of our successful winter sports season, organized athletics are so important for exercise, so socialization, and mental health, despite the added challenges associated with group sports during a pandemic. Even though there is still snow on the ground, the days are getting longer and we are seeing more sunlight, which makes it easier for teams to practice outside. I think we are all happy to see that as a sign that spring is eventually coming, and along with that, an increase in vaccinations and hopefully the ability to have more outdoor events. I know that we are all hopeful that the spring will also bring the return of even a small sense of normalcy and maybe even more students to the classrooms. Also, I know that our seniors will be happy to hear that it is becoming increasingly more likely that we could even see the return of a normal graduation with masks and even some outdoor senior spring activities. In summary, there are many reasons to be hopeful going forward. Thank you. Thank you so awesome. Much. Thank you, Casey. Uh, Madam Chair, still nobody in the studio, so if it's okay with you, I can, I can go on to the superintendent. Sure. Okay, so uh, as Casey referenced, we are uh, speakers references a lot of these even before today there was a lot of uh, changes that have happened since our last meeting uh, the first big change on february 12th uh there's a transportation guidance update uh, and as many of you may remember from early on in the year we were able to have students travel uh, but they were staggered and when i say they, when I say they were staggered what i mean is that they were sitting uh not one behind another, but they were one person might be the window. The seat behind them was uh, in the uh, corner way. And so that's changed. Uh, the guidance that we came up with recently says as long as they've got to wear it, as long as they're wearing masks, the windows are open, uh, we can add uh, any more children on the bus. Uh, so in terms of our preparation, that's a big obstacle for us to overcome. Uh, it prevents us from having to say to parents, but you've got to drive your students if we don't have enough space on buses and we can't acquire more buses. Um, so that was one big update. Uh, second update, um, we are uh, talking with Mr. Cohen today and we're looking at potentially having school committee meetings back in person here at the middle school. We've done it typically at the high school, but as everyone knows, trying to get into the high school parking lot is impossible because of the building project. Now you have to park way down on 113, uh, but the middle school has a parking lot right next to it. And also, um, I talked to Mr. Cohen today, and we could both have up to 70 people in this space. Uh, so again, having a, 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 a drive school committee meeting with the public comment here in person uh, is on the horizon. We'll keep you posted on when that might happen. Uh, we had, had one of the uh, speakers reference the letter that went out. Uh, and I, I appreciate him uh, mentioning that letter. Just it, 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 for those of you who didn't see it, it was basically uh, just recognizing that first, it's been 11 months, almost that whole year, that we had to uh, close our doors for the rest of the spring. Uh, and then since that time, we've been making adjustment after adjustment. Uh, the second part of that letter went on to talk about how starting this week, Students were being added in. We'll talk about that uh, in a little bit. Uh, but, but obviously, for all of us here in the school committee and administrators, like students are our goal. That's our goal. 
And we want to have as many students in the seats as possible. Uh, so because of that, uh, there's been some misinformation out there, which is why we posted this letter. We had it reviewed uh, by the health agents and representatives from each town that the people that I meet with on a weekly basis all tell me what's going on in the town and how it impacts the school. So we had uh, all of them were in on this because there's a sentence that's really important is that they dictate to us what we can and cannot do. So if a local health agency decides that something can happen at 8, it can only be at 8 feet, and it can only be at 8 feet. The school committee does not have the ability to override uh, any board now. Uh, so I think that's an important clarity. And that was in here in the, in, in the letter that all those individuals maintain a six feet of social distance and the recommended amount of space to best prioritize the health and safety of our school community while the pandemic continues. And again, the excitement, the excitement about today, and I'll talk about it later, is there seems like there's some light, some light on the horizon. Uh, and we'll, we'll hear a little bit about that uh, later on when we start talking about the plan. Uh, as soon as um, the commissioner spoke this morning, then the governor and the commissioner in the afternoon, I was able to go in and make adjustments because a lot of that uh, yeah, exciting. I'm curious to see what it, what, what it ends up being. But uh, we'll talk about that later on. And it was just reminders about uh, being safe. So now I just wanted to make everybody aware that that letter did go out Friday. Um, if you want to get something out, just to let people know that it's not, this is not, we are never in a state of uh, being static. We're always being very dynamic, making adjustments, making changes based on what we can do uh, to help students um, get into the classroom. So uh, in addition to that, um, the, the governor, the commissioner, the governor update, the commissioner came out first, and the governor held a two o'clock um, press conference. And in both those meetings, um, they, they cited that they're looking to have reduce the number of remote students and increase the number of K through five uh, to pull in person. Um, there wasn't a tremendous amount of details, but the commissioner was giving everybody a heads up that he's not taking that to the state board of education, obviously. Uh, we're very excited by that. We're, we're curious to see what the State Board of Education does with it. I'm excited to see what that, what that new guidance might be, and hopeful that they've uh, collaborated and have to believe with the governor in this, that they obviously collaborated with the Department of Public Health, which just makes everything so much easier. Um, so that, that's, that's that whole piece. We'll talk a little bit more in detail um, when we get there about the, um, about the, the return plan, or the updated return plan. And then the vaccine clinics. So I think everyone who's watching the news is aware of shortages. But it's interesting in Massachusetts, we've had um, uh, regionally, we've had Newburyport, Newbury, Amesbury, Salisbury, Raleigh, Grove, West Newbury, Merrimack, all coming together to create a lower Merrimack Valley um, vaccine clinic. And I know many of us have volunteered at those. Um, and I just want to give a shout out to all volunteers, a shout out to all those towns. Uh, to make that happen, to really make that happen. Um, and, and it appears as though the state should be super sites. Uh, locally, I know a lot of those groups, a lot of those towns I mentioned, are still trying to, uh, trying to keep going with what they've started. Um, and and uh, they keep on requesting to save for more vaccines because I, I would agree with them. Uh, based on what I saw the three times I was there, it, it, they are super efficient and they're vaccinating the people that are in their own communities. Um, so, you know, we'll, we'll see what that is. But I just want to give a huge shout out to everyone that helped organize that and, um, and, and that work together. That's a lot of talent bringing together, and it just, it wasn't a very simple task. So thank you to all of those folks. All right, Madam Chair, we do have, uh, that's, I'm done with my news, and I see, actually, Tracy is now here. And yep, she's bringing her, hold on, Jane, actually, I just wanted to do one second. Um, so we're going to go back to Ashley, and we're going back to public comment. So, Ashley, you are live, and, and you are on. You're on the screen. All right. Thank you so much. I, I apologize. I was having trouble getting in, but no um, so um, I just want to say thank you first for um, taking the time. Um, I, I come tonight in front of you virtually to request a vote that you. Uh, reopen the schools and I ask that you request I am requesting that you reopen and set a date 
to reopen the schools, similar to the motion that Emily Dwyer made to close a school. Or at the very least, I am asking that you set a date to um, prepare and have that discussion. I'm asking that it's at the next meeting that there be a date set. I know that the news is constantly changing and quite frankly, um, so what I had written to speak tonight has changed a little bit just based on what has been prepared and promoted or suggested by Desi and the governor today. But I do want to make one thing very clear. There is only one body who can open the schools in Pentucket. It is only the school board and the school board alone who makes that decision. There is a lot of discussion about the Board of Health. And to be clear, the boards of health don't believe they, many of them, do not believe they even have a say in this. But what is ultimately clear is the power is yours. The board, and you know that, because you did not consult with the Board of Health when you went to shut the Bagnell down. You did not care what the Board of Health said. You know that when you set up hybrid learning, because no one asked what the Board of Health said way back in August. So that is not, it, it is something you should consider and they deal maybe with spacing, but it is not, they're not the, the body that is going to make that decision. It's you. I understand, and I am not naive, that in order to reopen the schools, there's a lot of things that have to be, get done. And I am asking this board, of the nine of you, which one of you is gonna be the one to stand up and say, why not us? Which one of you is gonna be the person to open the discussion and say, Rain Tree's opening, why can't we? How did they do it? Which one of you is gonna be the leader in your group to determine that, hey, let's acknowledge what the parents need and are asking for, which is information. And the great news is you have an army of parents who want to help you. Tap on your resources. Tell us what you need done. Because again, this is not a your problem. This is not your problem. This is all of our problem to accomplish. And as tired as you are of hearing from me, and quite frankly, as tired as I am of writing, imagine what you could get me to accomplish if you told me what you needed. Then think about all of the parents who want to also help you. Do you need, because again, to accomplish this, do you need tables? Do you need tents? Actually, what do you do? I know I'm closing in on my time and I'm nearly done, but give me a minute. I, do you need that done? Because what do you do when you need something done and you don't know how to do it? First, you go to YouTube and then you call a friend. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm asking you, call on your friend, call on your community, determine what needs to be done and then ask us to help because that's what we want to do. We're not here to harass you. We're here to help you. Let us help you. I thank you. Thank you, Ashley. Ashley. All right. And now, just so you know, we're missing Sarah Perry and Joel Clark. Uh, so if they are out there and they're trying to get in, uh, so we can keep on moving down the agenda. Yes, I think so. Okay. All right, we're on to new business, uh, and we are discussing the before school program. So for that, we'll turn it over to uh, Greg Lebrecht, and there's a microphone right here. Greg, I think they'd be able to hear you, but just in case. Can you hear me if I talk like this? Can hear you. Okay. Um, as you heard from the first speaker, um, we've had some parents having trouble finding options for their children that are used to the before and after program. So we're closed beginning of the year along with many other things we did. 
Uh, so with the athletics coming back and other things coming back, I figured I'd bring it before you guys to see how you feel about it now. Uh, it would be, in spite of what the uh, Mr. Kelly said, we'll be lucky to find any staff, hopefully, to run it at all. We have so many openings and paras and things right now. It's just we don't. It's not a lot of hours. It doesn't pay a lot of money. And quite frankly, with the federal relief bills, most people make more money not doing anything. So it's hard to find bodies. So we're hoping we can find bodies if you want to open it. If we did open it, of course, the six feet rules are apply. The children are not allowed to interact, no different than anything else we do right now. Um, we'd be able to do 40 people at Bagnell, 40 at Page, 30 at Donahue. Uh, you can only go on the day if you go to your cohort. No mixing of cohorts, it's not going to be anything like that. Um, if anybody else, more than anybody wanted to do that 40 that we could fit into that day, we'd have to institute a lottery. Um, we haven't, I mean, we've had a lot, we've had some parents ask for it, not to the volume we could open it up to, though. We certainly haven't had 110 students ask for it. Uh, it'd be only AM at this time, unless, I mean, if you want to bring up the discussion of PM, I suppose it would be, but that's usually when we start fogging all the buildings and stuff and ask the custodians to have to wait around two and a half hours before they start that important work for the rest of the school would require more staff, again, to handle it. Um, but, uh, I understand Mr. Kelly's thing about kids having all these activities and things, but again, the children wouldn't be allowed to think. It's no different than in the regular classroom. You have to wear your mask, you have to sit six feet apart. That's just the rules we live by right now. If those rules change, then these rules would change. But that's about the best we could do with that. Um, if you decide to go forward with this, we'd probably send out a blanket email to everybody, say it's a first come, first serve basis. The program would most likely start on March 8th. And like I said, that's a risk going forward, hoping to God I can get two people per site to work. Because as I said, we're down a lot of positions in the power level right now, anyways. It's just not a lot of people out there, so it'd be a hope that if we go forward and open it, we can put it out there and we can get some people to come back. I'll hear what your thoughts are and what your decision is. Chris has his hand up. I know, I, had, I was on mute. Chris Markins. Oh, sorry. Um, can you give a little context? Uh, I certainly wasn't here. What was the, the, was it strictly a COVID restrictions issue that caused the shutdown at the start of the year, or was it a, a staffing yeah. challenges, or was it? It's, it was a combination of everything, but basically it's been, we were just, because we had spent so much time when we first came back to the school, it was all about keeping everything as clean as humanly possible. We were fogging things, we were wiping down doorknobs, and we just didn't want the staff to, you know, be able to clean the cafeterias after they were done, and then run back to do the rest of what they had to do. So we, at the same time, we were also waiting on athletics. We hadn't even done that yet. That all started late, right? remember? Everybody was still, this, so athletics slowly came back. It wasn't until the last month no one had really asked about the before and after program, but a few people have now. So I suppose to be consistent, we thought we'd bring it back to you with athletics, coming back, see how you felt about this. Murray, and then Emily. I think if there's a way that you can do it, then we should absolutely do it because, you know, as Ben say, it helps give them access to kids access to their education. And I feel like, yeah, it is expensive to fog and take time and custodial staff, but if we're willing to come in after hours, be school, we should be willing to do it for our students, for them to have access to their education on April 14th. So I'd be in favor of it. Thanks, Marie. Emily? Um, I am in uh, absolute support of this um, for some of the reasons Marie just mentioned. Um, obviously, as a working parent, I totally understand the strain that this is putting on a lot of people. Um, so if we can make it work and make it work safely, I am all for it. Um, also, as the as Mr. Kelly mentioned, I, I do, although obviously they are going to be restricted to the six distance and all of those things, there are plenty of things that they 
will be able to do. So I, for people who are feeling concerned, like that sounds a little draconian, there are plenty of things that they will be able to do. And I'm sure that we can, you know, there are games that they can play from six feet away. Guess who, you know, those kinds of games. So there are plenty of things that they can do. That's not going to be the kids sitting at a table six feet away in their own bubble, not talking to anyone. Thanks, Emily. Joanna, and then Chris. Um, so I would definitely like to see the before school program started immediately. If we have to vote to do that tonight. I would also though like to see um, this come back with a plan for the after school program, just like some advice. Can you, you know, look into this? Can you get staffing for it? Um, is it possible? And what would it look like from a custodial standpoint? I just think we need, you know, more information. So I, you know, I'll, after Chris speaks, I'd be happy to make the motion to start the before school program. And then I would like more information on the after school at the next meeting, which is next week. The after school part of it is easily implementable. The problem is right now, we just shut when the kids leave our schools, they're shut down all across the board. There's no parent teacher conferences going on. No one's coming into the buildings. So you'd be basically voting to open up all that other stuff too, if you want to. Because like I said, right now, that's when the custodians get to cleaning immediately after the kids all leave. And nothing's been going on in these buildings at night, except for a few basketball games. The rest of them have been shut down tight and dark. So open the after program until 5.30 or so at night, that takes three and a half hours of custodial time away from the cleaning part. Yeah, that's that's why at the next meeting, I just like to have something brought back about, you know, give us the information we need to make that decision. More information on it. Good. Chris Redding, you had your hand up. Yeah, um, so a couple of questions. One, I think when you listed out the schools, I didn't hear you say sweets, or I don't know if it's intended. Sweet has never had the program. Oh, sweet. Okay. The so, children get to draw to you, and then after the bus drops from kids off at dawn, you continue on the sweet track. Those kids get on the bus at dawn. Okay. So that clears that up. Um, the other, the other. So I'm totally in support of this. I think it's something that um, we need to give the communities to help them. You know, the parents who are in situations that they need this service. Um, I am very concerned with such a small number of staff members like if one morning a staff member can't show up then what happens and who does who does the default coverage is that the principal but what if the principal has other things like like i am very concerned um that there could be a time where parents are dropping kids off and there aren't people to necessarily watch them um i hope that what emily said about actually having the kids do something while they're there and not just sit there on I don't even know what they would do on their own. Um, you know, you, you could have some behavioral issues that have to be attended to. Like that's a long time to ask kids to sit and not be engaged in anything. So I'm hoping that that's not actually what's gonna happen because I think, you know, at that hour of the day, the kids need to have something creative and useful that they're doing. So um, that's it. Yeah, it's more like what the things that they, I'm not saying you couldn't play an I spy game or something like that. What I'm saying is what they're used to before crafts and things, right. that can't happen. It'll be all over the floor. We just don't have time to pick up after that. Just don't, there's one custodian in the school and they have to, they have other cleaning responsibilities. They can't do what they need to do. We spend an hour cleaning the cafeteria up and don't have it. So they can play games and things like that. It just won't be crafts. Right. Does anyone else have anything to add? Madam Chair, I have a question. Yes, and then Dick and then Lisa. Uh, if we had the staff, I would make an emotion. I would make a motion to restart the before school program immediately. However, since we do not have the staff, I'd like to make a motion that the business manager look into restarting the before school program uh, at this particular time. And the uh, looking into involves recruiting staff. Chris, Mar we have a motion. Does anyone second it? I still have a question. Oh, okay. Uh, I, I, I'll second it. <laughs> and then Lisa. And now ahead. discussion, Lisa. Thank you. Sorry. Um, okay. So I have no problem with starting the before school program. I think it's a great idea and I think it's, it's, it's very much needed. But my concern lies with the after school program 
if the custodians, you know, they're spending a lot of time cleaning the building every single evening uh, to make way for the next day of school, if we have this program at three elementary schools, would it be, does it bring in enough income? That does the before and after school program bring in enough income that we could hire another custodian to take care of the after school section of it? Uh, to, be honest, I mean, say, to be honest with you, this would probably be a break even or small loss event to do it. It's more or less to help the parents out. Because uh, no, because we're basically cutting the number of children we usually have by a considerable amount. So, this is, the economy of scale has changed. It's more of a help than it is a profit maker for sure for this year. Uh, right now, we're discussing the four school program. Though, so next week, or I guess it is next week, um, Lisa, he'll, he can probably address those issues. Okay. Chris Markins. Yeah, sorry, just point of clarification. I, I totally hear Dick's concerns. I sort of assumed that in the the idea of opening the morning, we were going to be, to be giving him the go ahead to explore that possibility as part of opening the program. Obviously, if there's no staff, I don't think they would start up the program. I'm worried that the additional motion would delay the process by a certain period of time, and we can just sort of give him the go ahead. To, assuming that staff are part of that process, I guess is how I took the motion. Yes, correct. Does anyone else have anything to discuss? Or okay, the motion, uh, Joanna. So I'm going to vote no on Dick's motion just because I want to put forth a different motion, which would just be to open the before school program. So when I vote no, that is why. Can you reread Dick's motion? Because now I feel confused. I can tell you. Since we presently do not have staff, I made a motion to have the business manager look into restarting the before school program. And if we find the staff, then we're gonna move forward on that anyways. Is everyone clear? So that has nothing to do with after school. No, that, that we're not discussing after school. No, okay. it's separate at this particular moment. I get that, but I was confused by what Joanna said. Uh, Emily and then uh, Lane. Can I ask Joanna what Joanna, what would your motion be? My motion would just be to restart the before school program. And Wayne? Yeah, I agree with Joanna. I think Dick uh, it should be somewhat obvious to all of us uh, if we open it up right now and we can't get the staff, then uh, we can't do it. So I say tonight, let's vote yes, let's get it in. And never mind taking a look and pausing it for another two weeks to have him come back with uh, information whether he got him or not. Let's okay it and uh, go from there. And we'll try to get the staff to make it uh, doable. If that will make it easier for everyone, I'll withdraw my motion. Thank you, Dick. So, Joanna, do you want to re? Um, so I don't, I think technically we can't, Dick cannot withdraw his motion because it's been seconded. So we have to take a vote on that motion and then I can propose a different motion. Okay. So I roll call vote. <laughs> Wayne? No. Joanna? No. Emily? No. Marie? No. Dick? No. Lisa. No. Chris Markins. No. Chris Redding. No. And Dina Trotta. No. Hey, Joanna. I'd like to make a motion to approve restarting the before school program. Second. Okay. Is there any more discussion on this? Good. Uh, roll call vote. Wayne. Yes. Joanna. Yes. Emily. Yes. Marie. Yes. Dick. Yes. Lisa. Yes. Chris Markins. Yes. Chris Redding. Yes. 
and Dina Trotta. Yes. Approved. Justin, has anyone joined us or no? I'm Joe Joe I'm sorry, say that again. So Joe he's here. So Joe is here. He was, uh, he's patiently been waiting. He apologized. He'll tell you himself when he gets on screen. All right, perfect. Okay. Uh, back, so, to, back to public back, comment. Back, back to public comment. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, sorry for being late. Uh, just tried to get food for the family and get back in time. Uh, I got back just in time to hear the young lady before that last discussion you guys just had uh, going forward. And uh, as I listen to her, I'll be honest with you to tell you that I'm sitting there going, okay, well, she's pretty much saying everything that I was going to say. So uh, not on here to um, chastise or to, to get at you all. I know you have a uh, relatively thankless responsibility. And uh, I empathize with everyone involved in everything you guys have gone through for the past year, uh, from the teachers uh, all the way up to the top and then back down. Uh, I guess I look at this and, and I'm on here to just say that there are masses in this town, masses being a very relative term, not too dramatic. Uh, as my wife and I talk to friends, neighbors, uh, our kids, uh, parent, friends, parents, I, I'm, I know that there are people that have great concern, but there are the concern that we're hearing is we're not doing enough to move the prospect of putting kids back in school forward. Uh, I know you're hearing this tirelessly. I have sent a couple emails myself, uh, not to be a broken record, but it's what's going to happen. You're going to get a broken record. And, and she said it best when she said about, I guess, leading. And uh, when I was at the gym today talking to some parents that are in our school district, and, and I said, you know, it's funny, a year ago, uh, uh, the Kentucky school district was the pride and joy of this area and, and rightly so. And not that it's not, but uh, it seems like it would be um, really great for us to possibly be that, that new shining star again and show people how it can be done and be more aggressive uh, and, and more proactive in our approach, a little less fear-based, a lot more um, positive and hopeful based. Uh, yes, I realize there are some ramifications. We all live with those day in and day out. My wife does every day when she goes to work. Uh, risk is there for all of us, but um, we just don't want to leave these kids behind. Uh, it's uh, I'm grateful and fortunate that my wife and I currently have a setup that, that's workable, although not ideal. Uh, I feel for the parents that can't, get on, can't do a Zoom call don't have this ability and and just uh, this i just can't even fathom what they're going through and i know they're out there there's got to be tons of them so uh, i'm on here to say please 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 be aggressive be proactive be looking for every possible way scenario and opportunity to get kids back three days four days five days now not next year not two years now in in the spring of, of 2021 uh, give it a, a test run, see how it works before the end of school comes. And so that way you guys are, or collectively as a town, we have uh, something under our belt to say we did it. Uh, there are towns that are doing it. There are private schools that are doing it. I realize there's hurdles, uh, but please, I just, I, I really want to see uh, some movement on that. Uh, my wife and I are and will be involved in, in, in uh, things in the coming future. There's a possibility for an open school committee um, vacancy and, and, and that might be in, in our future, who knows? So uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, keep okay. There you go, bingo. <laughs> right on time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Dr. B, COVID numbers, impact on schools, discuss, possibly approve. Yes, so let me go ahead, I'm gonna go ahead and share. Um, so first, just our, our update that we do each meeting on our numbers. Uh, and they look bad news, right? 
see, and I kept this up, and only this is just a three week, but I kept it up there just so we could see the numbers as they've been growing over time. Uh, so when you look at growth, that, that's, that's 80. That's back just over a month ago. We're at 80. Roland, as of last Thursday, down to 11. So from 11.5% positivity rate down to 2.3. West Newbury, uh, they peaked at 25 on the 21st, but they were at 22 that same stock period, and they're down to 10. So from 5.37 to 2.59. They're the only town here that's gone up by one, but it's such a, it's such a small sample that's uh, not significant, of course. And in America, here they were peaking at 59 at the same time the world was peaking at 80. They've gone from 50 now, they're in the green, uh, down to 14. Um, so just, uh, as you can imagine, that's just uh, outstanding news. Um, so the next thing I wanted to show you is a COVID dashboard. Again, that, that first chart and the second chart, I'll be able to get to the uh, impact on the school. I'll be able to show folks how to see uh, both of those. Um, the COVID dashboard, and, and just because you scroll down, then just so people know how to navigate, you see December. So when we started doing this at the end of December, it's the first week was 10, 14, 5, 17, so 5 was great. And we started getting into the holiday season. We get 17, we get 22, 13, 5, 7. These are students and employees in our district. And then we hit February. And it's big down. So two, two, zero last week. And last week was vacation week. Uh, and here we come back and we have five. So this number right here, you know, again, you just saw the town numbers, those are great. And this number right here, uh, across the board, I think most people are expecting to see a bump up uh, in our three-week town numbers because of February vacation and people traveling. Um, you know, and, so what we'll see, obviously, for us, going to 2205, that looks like the schools, maybe that's the case, um, but really, that there's not enough data, and frankly, not enough data right here uh, to see here. So that, that, as I've done in the past, uh, I'll show you as well, just the, the school, it's not, it's not gonna be super informative, uh, because we have a lot of zeros in the school the previous week, there's just not a, a tremendous amount to do the, the, the share, but when you look at it, so this is, remember my point of expression, this was the, this is the town, you just look at growth, growth in the green. So there's their 80, and then there's the 11. So we look at growth at 2.3% 11 cases. Uh, right now, so last week there was zero, so it's all zeros. Right now it's zero, the middle school and the high school. That's the last 14 days. West Newbury uh, uh, has been, 10 cases in the community, and pages had zero. And then in Merrimack, they had 14 cases, uh, and there are zeros across the board as well. So it's just, it's bad just to see uh, that. Um, we'll see those numbers, and, and obviously we hope that those uh, continue in that direction, though that's not what we're expecting. So, so we'll see. We'll see how this goes, but if those are the numbers. Before I go on, does anybody have any numbers on the question? I've got any questions on that. So, I will say, I, I, I do think I might have made one mistake on there, but I'll make that adjustment. It looks like it might be seven days instead of the 14 days. Mr. Marcus, I see your hand. Um, I don't see it. Totally okay if you do not know this, but do you happen to know where those numbers put us in the context of the CDC's new color coded guidance? All right, so uh, the CDC's new color coded. We're in the big, I forget what color they had it. I, I think it's, is it, I forgot to yeah, open it's, it up. It's, there's, there's a block where the big block and the color coded thing. And the uh, first one's on the left. The yeah, left. I, I, so if I, I, if I, I should look it up right now, sorry. sorry. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. I, I, I should have, yeah, I should have had it called up myself before I asked you. All right, so. The next thing I want to talk about, uh, we, we've had discussions about this, and there was a couple of requests from uh, the school committee just to, uh, what are we, what are the plans, where are we? Uh, so the exciting news was this morning, the commissioner getting on, 
and saying that he is going to take the State Board of Elementary and Secondary Education a proposal uh, whereby remote education and hybrid education would be phased out and K-5 would be pushed K-5 into full in-person uh, in sometime in April. And the governor did a two o'clock press conference with the commissioner. Well, um, it was not a lot of details that they told, but that, I mean, I described this to a parent today. It's like there's been a very cloudy, cloudy sky, and you have the sun breaking through with some light. So we had the vaccines, we had the first rays, we have an announcement like this. And for me, it's exciting because one, uh, the opportunity to have uh, the Department of Public Health, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Ed on the same page, the governor's office. Uh, working together uh, to provide new guidance to us uh, is that, that be tremendous. That means things are obviously heading in the right direction. Uh, at the <laughs> and um, for, for me, that meant I had to sit down and immediately start going over and just make adjustments to uh, this plan. So I'm going to share with everyone. Let me just open this up. Um, it, it, I posted this on our website. Um, so if you'll just indulge me. So if we're on um, Beyond Google, if you go to the district's website, it looks like this. And if you go to our district, there's a COVID-19 dashboard. So you can click on the COVID-19 dashboard. And here's three different tabs. So the Google, this Google sheet gives the past three weeks COVID cases. That's the spreadsheet I showed you. Um, so the first, just for the three tabs. Second spreadsheet um, is uh, for the schools. What are the number of positive cases we have in our schools for students and staff? This third one is one that we just added uh, this evening. And this is the, the, up, the updated return plan from what we had. Uh, Justin, we're not seeing these tabs. Oh, I'm sorry. You know what? All right. That's okay. I, I got you. Thank you. Sorry about that. I'm on it. So what happens is it opens a new window and it's only sharing this window. So let me stop sharing um, this one. And I will share it. So when you went to the home page, the next tab you would see is going to be um, this tab right here. No, no I didn't do this. <laughs> that was a trick. It's a nice family portrait. <laughs> yeah. Justin, if you share the application screen, does that? So I, I tried that book That earlier. doesn't work it's just, either. It's not. It's, it's a shady guy. No. It's the application. Maybe so. Yeah. I think in the application window. We'll try this. Oh, yeah. So we're going to uh, Blanche has come up. Doc Blanche has come up with something. We'll see if this works. All right. So if you're in, and yeah. I'm sure just tell me, no, still not there. It's okay. I, I got this. It doesn't matter. So if you go to there, you'll, you'll see links with three pages. One of the one of the links is the updated um, plan, which I'll put up on the screen right now. So, manager, you can see that. Yes. Yes. Okay, thank you. So on, on the updated plan, uh, let me just. This is a link. So again, if you go to the district website on the uh, district that is COVID-19 updates. So this is one of those three links. And I, I apologize, I'm gonna just read through some of the key parts of this, but I open up with just this note. Uh, and the note is that as a district, we'll provide all students with the opportunity to return fully in person learning five days a week. As soon as public health guidance, federal, state, and local public health officials indicate that safe. And which one of those three has the top hand? Federal, state, uh, or local? Oh, that's a, so the, the local, locally, if we decided, the local is getting their directive from Mass Department of Public Health. Mass Department of Public Health has a time varied from the CDC. So the local is taking their cue from the state, from the Mass Department of Public Health. Uh, and then for us, when we want to have something put into place, we have to run it by the local, uh, local boards or, the, or their respective health agents. 
Uh, so we heard that comment earlier. Of course, as you all know, that those plans were run by these town's health agents because we get back not only were they run by them, the health agents showed up in the buildings and walked through them with us to make sure that they uh, were adequate and met their specifications. Again, that's that's their arena, not ours. Our arena is educated. Their arena is uh, the medical. So, Justin, just to be clear, when that woman, um, Miss Miss Ashley, it, she was saying that it's our decision, but it's it's not our it is not our decision, correct? It's the ultimately the public health de decision. Yeah. So, so we can go ahead and we could say we want students to be back at five p.m. on Friday, and we can say that they can come back at five p.m. or four p.m. And we say that that's fine, but we're only approved for six p.m. Um, and, and so when we meet, if we're going to make adjustments and we've had these conversations before. Um, like when, when we talk about warmer weather coming, and can we potentially see, because number one, you might be able to we potentially see more in regard to first and second grade students, just kind of as a pilot. Um, you know, the, the, that's a conversation we have on those early Wednesday meetings. And they, they just tell me what is and what is not possible because they have a direct pipeline to mass communication that I don't have. Uh, and the response to this point is that we're, we're still going to hold the six feet. A part of the hope was vaccination for the educators that that might help us get them for, but yes, that is that is correct. I mean, if the school committee said tomorrow we're starting at three feet, we, we can't. We, we, we would need the police board of health uh, to say yes, we can start at three feet. But this is the same exact process that you're all aware of that we are required to do by the MIA to get both the local school committee and local board of health approval in order to participate uh, in athletics. Of course, for us, because of the fact that high school base, the athletics for us is West Newbury because we don't have high school athletics in Merrimack or um, that answers your question, Madam Chair. Yes, thank you. Sure, no problem. Question. Yes, sir. Uh, Commissioner Jeffrey Riley announced today that he is seeking authority to transition. Yeah, so where I is that? Uh, where is that authority coming from? So that is, the, so I haven't gotten to that part, but I'll answer your question. That is from the State Board of Elementary and Secondary Education. So he, at like, it's kind of like me going before all of you saying, hey, I'd like to do X, Y, Z. You give my, you, you can say, you have safe comments and then you give approval. Uh, he has to do the same thing as the commissioner. He has to go before the State Board and make some proposals and get approval. So specifically, Mr. Hodges, what he is, referencing what he's asking approval for is a change in state regulations for what counts as time on learning and he is seeking the authority from the board to basically regulate that himself you know as a as a sort of a staggered way over the next so many months so madam chair i know you can't see him but i can we've got uh mr martin has his hand raised yeah I, Sorry, I, I think you guys sort of just covered it. I would just add, um, yeah, right. They they changed what was considered time on learning for the pandemic. He is now essentially saying that he's seeking approval to remove remote learning as considered qualifying for time on learning. And I think again, we don't know for sure what's going to happen, but I would encourage everybody to uh assume the board is going to give him that approval that he would not have come out today that like this if he did not think that he was going to get it so i would just i would encourage us all to just think in a world where this, this has been approved so yeah. we'll talk about it and we should clarify though for parents at home if parents have opted for a fully remote yeah. model that's not what they're referencing for this year at least that's how we understand it at this point at this point right so in one question, yes, Dr. Right? Blanchard. So has the school district actually asked the Board of Health, would you approve us at three feet? And they have said no. We, we, so we've talked about four feet. Yep. And, and, they, and, the answer was not and so if the school committee was to make a motion in order to, you know, open the schools, would that encourage the Board of Health to consider it? Like, what I worry about is that, you know, these are people, Board of Health, it's their job. Nobody wants to make the wrong decision. I'm an elected, I, I could care less, you know, if I 
lose my school committee position because I make the wrong decision. Sure. But I'm very happy to make a motion to try to reopen the schools preemptively before this April deadline if it could possibly take the heat off of some of our local officials. It's just I mean, so something for consideration. We brought up the four feet. Uh, we were targeting maybe eight as long before. This is three weeks ago. Yeah, I think mm -hmm. I mentioned this in the last meeting. Seems an eternity ago. Yeah, so it was, we were targeting maybe eight months And as late as maybe April vacation, the thought at that point was we would have educators vaccinated. You know, more comfortable with them coming in, maybe drop it down, particularly for specifically for one and two, which are the critical areas, uh, time frames, and because of our, our numbers. Although most of our numbers there, uh, it'll be doable. I think we have one school with one grade level being a challenge, but yeah, and, and it was you know, it was not something that we were, we're not approved to do right now. It was wait and see uh, what happens down the road. Again, they're they're going to take their they're going to take their cues from the mass department of public health. So, if based on today's announcement, right, um, and, and what Mr. Markin said, I, I would agree. Like the commissioner's not going to come out and say, and then the commissioner's not going to come out and say that. The governor is definitely not going to come out and say that unless they're pretty confident they have the votes. And I think it was in the governor's conference they referenced that they've been working closely with the department of public health. So I think that will that's potentially going to be a sweeping change. I, I mean, we're very curious. I think we'll, what's that, is that meeting next? Tomorrow, one tomorrow, another one. I, I think what we're saying is we assume Mass Department of Public Health will begin advising under circumstances when it would be appropriate for three or four feet. Okay. Would, be, would be coming soon in order for all of this to happen. Okay. So, so right now, and I know there's, we, we've had these conversations, but right now, both the Department of Public Health and the CDC both still have six feet as the safest preferred distance uh, to which to. Yeah. And it is true there are some local towns in Massachusetts whose local Department of Public Health said it was fine to do less than six feet. Uh, but those are fairly limited, um, and maybe they will grow incrementally yeah. over, over the next and, 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 and the other part of that is a lot of those places, their situations are very different. And we'll, we'll talk about some of those. Right. Yeah, yeah. Mr. Marcus. So, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to caution us all again just based on um, the communication that went out today from Jesse to all districts. Um, I have no doubt that they are... Um, there's a lot of conversations happening behind the scenes with DPH to try and get everybody on the same page. I think it's notable that DPH was not referenced today in these conversations, which means that maybe they are not there yet. And in fact, the communication that came out today, including talking about distancing, they guess he specifically referenced three feet being supported by WHO, local public health experts, infectious disease physicians, the mass chapter of the Academy of Pediatrics, and the governor's COVID-19 medical advisory board, and they attached a letter, which is one page of a letter from public health experts and four pages of doctors who signed it, which all of this, which tells me that they are planning on moving forward hell or high water without DPH. Yeah, so, that is so, going to put people in a position. In so ours, because they did use the language the public health, right? With public health officials, which I just assumed to be as part of public health, but of I course, could so. might not be. Like you're right, they could have used funky language. Yeah, but this has kind of been the this has been the struggle that has caused so much confusion across the board. Um, because we take our, I take my directive from the commissioner, um, and, and, and the boards of health take their directive from the Mass Department of Public Health. So there's been a lot of disagreement, a lot of conflict. Um, at one point, Mr. Markins, you may remember this, they were able to come out with a, a addendum to one of the reopening plans because both were able to come together and agree that this is how something should go. Um, that that was yeah so, so we'll we'll see right it's I guess you're saying you're cautiously optimistic I, yeah I'm saying I'm 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 very hopeful but that we should I, I just think it would be wise to move forward assuming that that Desi is going to be continuing uh, to frankly mandate this whether DPH gets on board or not I, I know that he was asked specifically at the press conference today about. Yeah. Um, what about districts that can't even do three feet, which is a concern for a sure. lot of districts with limited building space, right? And I think his answer was, was well, um, those, those districts, districts should come talk to us. Yeah, In other sure, words, we're, sure. <laughs> I took, frankly, to mean 
that you come up with a plan that does the most distance you possibly can, and frankly, you're probably going to get your blessing. In other words, Desi is is moving, I think, pretty aggressively towards kids in buildings in April, <laughs> and and hopefully, I think they'll they'll again because it would make life easier, so much easier for everybody if all the state agencies got on the same page. But we may be we may be in a position where we have to make these decisions. Yep, sure. in yeah, Chris, we've been waiting that for that for like a year. Yeah, that's what I was saying. Right? This, this, what came up? What happened today? And what was said today? Oh my goodness! What happened today? And what was said today was what we. Justin, can you put the view on the on us talking since we're not talking about this of right here? I will do my best. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Emily and then Wayne. I mean, I'm sorry, Emily and then Dick. Okay, go ahead. I wasn't trying to interrupt him. He can finish talking first. So my question was, does does Justin have more to present to us before we ask these I questions? Do. Okay, right. so I would like to hear that <laughs> because it might answer some of our questions. Although I agree, I think right out of the gate, Chris's question was very on target and important to talk about, but I'm wondering whether waiting yeah. to finish your proposal. All right, so um, we just we head back to this. Um, so yeah, it, it, it just points out that was the, the most prudent distance for health and well being, and that was from the CDC deviation. As uh, Mr. Uh, Hodges pointed out, um, there is. Uh, So there is, um, Mr. Commissioner, this morning announced seeking authority, you just talked about that, but having students in person learning five days a week. So just a couple pieces. Uh, little, we, we talk about reopening our schools that we talk in. That, that is inaccurate. Our schools have been reopened. They haven't been reopened to every child coming in every single day. We're, we're all aware of that. We're all aware. That we all agree that's what we want. Uh, but our schools are not closed. Our schools have not been closed. Uh, Bagnell was, had that short amount of time. The high school had that short amount of time. And the middle school was the day, and that, of course, was for white person. Um, so Commissioner Riley indicated uh, middle school students may uh, they follow, but they, they really want kindergarten through fifth grade uh, fully in. Uh, there's the possibility that high school students may as well. So for the viewers, there's a lot of complexities once you start getting into secondary schools because you have students in our district who are seven periods. In middle school, they're on teams, so they're somewhat contained for four classes. And the other three classes, they move around. In high school, they move around for all seven classes. Um, so that's why it's a little bit slower uh, for high school. And even in the work that we've been doing the last month, uh, it's slower to add people into high school because if one class is full, you can't add a student even if the other three classes are empty because it's, it ends up with a conflict. So um, we eagerly await the decision from the State Board uh, on this proposal, uh, on the Commissioner's plan, and for the guys from Desi as uh, so they'll be finalized plans to bring students back fully back in person. Uh, should this distance be reduced to updated science-based public health guidelines, research, and our public health metrics, we will make a plan to bring in more or all students to provide updated information to our students, parents, guardians, faculty, staff, and community as soon as possible. As always, we thank everyone for all their patience, cooperation, understanding uh, throughout this entire pandemic. And I appreciate, uh, certainly, that Mr. Cantone mentioned, or Ms. Tracy it was, uh, that there, you know, the parents standing, waiting in the wings, uh, ready to take action if, if we need their support. So uh, much appreciated. So first step, so bringing in students on a level of need for in-person learning four days a week. So this process started several weeks ago where we got, got our second data point. Way back in the early fall, uh, we had 
this was late summer, early fall, we had that conversation about we have open seats, how do you don't use a lottery? There's, and there was no solid way. Uh, we now have our second data point of diagnostics based on that language. So um, we're able to use those to prioritize students who can come in person four days a week. Um, if there's more space, so we go through and do those priorities, if there's more space, we can add students based on need until the maximum capacity of the classroom is reached. Now understand, there's some classrooms, at elementary, again, it's different, but a second grade classroom at Spencer is not the same size as a second grade classroom at Page, and it's not the same size as a second grade classroom at Bagnell. The buildings are all completely different. They're not cookie cutters. So one of those second grade classes may have a capacity of 11. Another one might have a capacity of 18. So there, there's, there's differences uh, based on the six foot requirement and the physical space of the building. But again, that's all pending the approval of Commissioner Riley's plan. They may pull that out of the water and they end up moving something else. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, transportation guides are shifted, so buses are allowed to return transporting students at their normal capacity. All the capacity windows open, and just on the plan, it says that the parents uh, <clears throat> to work with their building principal, the building administration, or to break out the box of pickup. That was step one, and, and we're so just in a summary. Step one. We've identified the empty seats that are that are in classrooms. Those are being filled with students who are of greatest need, and that's based on diagnostics. It's not just purely diagnostics, though. As an example, Justin might be doing horribly. It might have looked like I've been just plummeting. But in a conversation with the teacher, you might discover it like he's doing fine. He just he was you know, just he messed up on one skill set. So Justin might not be identified. Um, but other students who might have been doing really well might be identified because it's like this is really struggling. So we were able to use uh, objective data with some subjective information um, and, and collaboration from the uh, classroom teachers. So just wanted to make you aware of that part. The second step on this. So it's a staggered return to in-person learning. And again, this is now contingent upon the guys from Desi, the local public health officials. But See, there's bold parts here. But if the Commissioner Riley's proposed plan to transfer the eight five students to fully in person, when it is approved, and local public health officials from both Merrick West be advised to give safe transition to fully in person learning uh, following Commissioner Riley's plan, and a shorter distance is determined to be feasible for district resources, the district will make a plan to transition to that newly established distance and will bring in more students full time. So let me explain that. That's a lot to consume. Here, Justin, can I ask one question, though? Yes, Madam Chair, of course. In the articles that I've read today just about their announcement, they're saying elementary schools and middle and high. Wouldn't that be K through six then? I'd never, it wouldn't be no. K through, so, for so, our district at least, it would be K through six. Yes. Yeah. Okay. But we just, I used his language of K five. But for us, it would be a whole lot of the food and the six grade nine. Okay, thank you. Yep, absolutely. I appreciate the question. Um, so it, it, the, you have to unpack this a little bit. So what, what we're saying here is, okay, commission's plan goes through. We're on board. The local health agents are on board. Great. So three feet. Now, anyway, we're going to rewind you way back to July when we were required to do a report to send it into the state. Like, what would it look like? Or we were required to do an analysis. I don't think we have to submit the report. But each, all the building admins went through with the team to say, what would it look like at three feet? So at three feet in classroom space, at three feet, we can fit most classrooms, not all classrooms, particularly at the high school, as it is there, we're not able to fit all classrooms. Uh, some of the area classrooms are very small. Uh, same here at the middle school, I believe their science classrooms are very small, built to some of the time periods. So, at three feet, we can fit most. And, and, and we can come up with a plan to accommodate those students in a creative way. But we run into a second problem. And that second problem, transportation would have been a third problem. But the second problem is if the requirement for six feet for eating still exists, and now we've got an issue. So where do you put those students? You can't fit them in the cafeteria. There's there's only so many lunches. So now you're trying to find all sorts of space. Um, I, I, if you are in a, an elementary school, 
where your cafeterias are much smaller than the one we're in right now, or the one in the high school, it, there's a there's a capacity limit at six feet. It, so six feet is nose to nose. It doesn't matter if you're in high school or elementary school, like it's still six feet. It doesn't matter about the size of the person. So that would greatly reduces the number of students we could have in the building. But again, we can get creative with this. Um, we can, you can, can we have outdoor lunch? Can you have, we looked at tents earlier, are tents possible? Um, if can we have half the kids in the classroom and half in? So that it becomes a supervision issue, but yes, I mean, those, so these are all things that we brainstorm to come up with possible solutions. I mean, there's, there's another option we can say, okay, you know what? At elementary, we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna say, we're gonna have to call down by grade levels. They can have snacks in the cafeteria at uh, like 11 o'clock. And then they go out to recess and they go home at one o'clock, 1.30. And that's when they have their, their lunch. So you're like flip-flopping an afternoon snack with uh, lunch. Uh, so there, there's there's ways to troubleshoot it, but it's um, it, it's it's complicated because again for our transportation we don't just serve Groveland Elementary we don't serve Bagdell those Bagdell drivers are also serving the high school and the middle school so it has to be a, a connection um, so if we're able to do that these are that's what that sentence is talking about it's we have all sorts of ideas of how we might be able to manage it. Um, you know, tents and outdoor lunch makes sense when we think about it. With sunny outside, and you have those. But of course, if there's a storm, what do we do? Are we calling off lunch for the day? Um, there's, there's a, there's a lot, there's a lot that has to be worked out. Um, and just frankly, you, know, you have trouble. And of course, if you shift the day, if you put lunch at the very end of the day, if you're sending students home early, that's going to have an impact on parents who might not have people. Leaving the lanes to receive the children when they go home. Uh, so that we might have created a bigger problem unintentionally while trying to do the right thing. Uh, but that, you know, that those are things that we, we, we have these conversations a thousand times since uh, since this began back uh, okay. uh, when the, the early uh, guys first came out. And the other, so not just for those reasons, those we can work it out, uh, but it's not going to be an immediate transition. You know, it, one of the commenters mentioned about the focus on furniture. Well, the focus on furniture is just not, not intended to be a focus on furniture. It's a, just a, a realization and an understanding that folks need to have that a classroom set up right now, teachers got their space in the front, it's set up for six feet. So you need to move hundreds of classrooms. And, and yes, I mean, I'm sure people will be volunteering all over the place. Our custodians will be working nonstop to make that happen as quickly as possible. Um, but you also need parents to make adjustments. You might need to make adjustments in your schedules um, and staff as well. I mean, they're going to have to set up how they have to get their room set up the way they want it. And that's typically what we do before school starts. Fortunately, we have in our pockets a couple of professional development days that we might be able to put in there to help out with that transition um, should it be needed. But again, I, I think at this point, um, the unexpected announcement this morning and uh, you know, the follow-up with the governor, it's, it's, it's energizing, it's energizing. Um, so again, the district may be limited resources, even the required physical distancing in the building, uh, while, we're able to be, while we may be able to get more students in the classrooms at less than, less than six feet. It does not change the fact that we may not be able to have the same number of students spaced out in six feet in the cafeteria. That's everything I just discussed, and this goes into the guidelines about the CDC. As of today, the CDC guidance when you're eating is a minimum of six feet. Um, so, so just that, that part's in there. And again, just thought we'll use whatever space, whatever additional spaces. And they have to be supervised. Uh, so again, we talk about the children. It, it, we have, there's requirements that we have to meet. That someone can't be working seven periods a day to help supervise the children wherever. Our, our educators are entitled to a lunch and uh, planning. Um, so students will be continue, will continue to be brought in based on their level of need until all students can return or will be returned to fully in person while we stagger and implement it. Not a stagger time, but stagger and implement it by grade. And then the third step is the full return. And, and we all know what that's looked like. It looks like that is the ideal. Um, as, our, as a district, that is our goal. Bring all students back as soon as it's safe to do so. 
that we all acknowledge fully, uh, full, fully in person learning is far superior to student learning, social emotional wealth, relationships, and so many other aspects of uh, child development. Um, so we're hopeful and planning to bring back students uh, back in person learning. Uh, for, certainly for 2021 2022, if we can get this rolling, uh, with well, the commissioners planning to improve, see how that works out. It is a battle for public health. Um, but we're, we're eagerly awaiting that decision. Um, so, as soon as uh, we have the guidance for safe return to fully in person learning or staggered return, uh, we'll begin finalizing a plan of what that looks like with members, all of everything that needs to be noted uh, and sent out to. Um, students, staff, parents, uh, and guardians. So that's the plan. And again, it's posted on the website. Uh, if, if you go to, I want to say this correctly. So if you go to our district, and under the under our district, it's, uh, it's COVID-19 dashboard. And on the very top, it's called the Tucket Return Plan, updated February 2021. So now I'm going to take this down. Can I ask a question on the plan before we take it down? Yes. So on page step two, step two, the first bullet where it says, if the commissioner does this, then we will do that. I really think that should be assuming, instead of if, it should be assuming commissioners Riley happens, like this happens and this and it happens and this happens. We're assuming that's going to happen. So we will be making a plan to bring back more students. I would really like to see the plan start to be made now so that the commissioner doesn't approve something and then we say, oh, we have to make a plan. So I guess I guess I would say to that if if we were told today that we could have four feet across the board, mm -hmm. we know exactly what to do. Like okay. we know how many students we get in each classroom, we should go ahead and do it. Right. You're just talking about a lot of stumbling blocks, potentially like with the lunch. Like how long would it take you to make a plan if you know if he said we can open it next monday can we open next monday and we have a plan in place to yeah, he said if lunch? he said next monday we can go down to three Four, feet three feet yeah today's tuesday yeah we i mean our, we, we would and our default would be we're going to need to shorten the day <clears throat> to have lunch in the afternoon so that uh, we get students home early well in the meantime we're, we're potentially searching for tents and uh, any other outdoor opportunities. I think Greg will probably chime in here. He's raised his hand. He's probably going to chime in here that the district's not likely to expend out funding on something we may not need. And I recall we did this in the fall. There was an insurance issue. Uh, so, so I, I just want to reiterate something. I mean, it's probably unique in that I've worked for the federal government, the state government, local government, and now regional school districts. Don't poo-poo the local board of health. You know you're not even required to have a police department or a fire department in your town by law. You are required to have a local board of health. These guys have immense power. No one ever sees it because they just this was a local board and nothing really happens. If you voted to go back to school, regardless of things, they would shut your whole building down. They could. And, and they, oh, they <laughs> most uh, likely will. If you push them and say, we're not taking what you say into account, we're going to do it anyways, they could shut your whole building down. Not hybrid, not anything. They could just shut you down. Justin, could you change the view for us? Be very careful when you think that Commissioner Riley is going to override them. He cannot, and he has no authority to do so. And quite frankly, you guys don't have the authority to do so either. They're very powerful when it actually comes down to it. Yeah, but I don't think that's what I'm suggesting. I'm just saying we need to oh, no, no, plan in place. Say, and the local board of health. Yeah, they, yeah no, uh, just, Emily uh, and uh, Dick have their hands up. Yeah. Emily, you're on mute. Um, so respectfully, I actually really disagree that if we voted tonight to change to uh, next Monday, that that could happen. Um, and I can say that with experience because we just went through this. Um, and today was our first day back with all of the kindergarten first and second graders. And we only had to switch the kindergarten classrooms with the first grade classrooms. And it still took two full days of completely asynchronous learning plus a week and a half planning before that because the things that people aren't thinking about, um, you know, the person who mentioned furniture, like 
that's the least of it. It's not just moving furniture. Do we have the furniture? It's sometimes moving technology because when you're talking about whether it's three feet or four feet or six feet, kids still have to be able to see where the teacher is teaching and the layout of the room may or may not lean, lend itself to that. So there are so, like Dr. Bartholomew said, there are so many different moving pieces that I, I do think we need to have a plan because I'm very concerned that Commissioner Riley, as has been done with other districts, is going to try to push this through regardless of what DPH and other people say. And then we'll, for lack of a nicer word, hold it over districts' heads um, to get them to do what they want, even if it causes the school committee and the school district to be in this between the rock and the hard place of you know, the commissioner and the board of health. So I, I think that we need to, as you guys said, like be making plans for the different contingencies. Um, but just like we were last summer, like you can only play out so many different um, creative options, um, creative uses of space without knowing what the guidance is. And that's my big concern here for everybody is that we don't really know what it's gonna you know will it be four feet will it be four and a half feet will it be three feet you know will it be different k to two than it is i mean so I, i'm so glad that you guys you know have been still thinking about that but i think we just need to be thoughtful about putting in the energy before the you know don't put the car before the horse is that what you're saying I guess, yeah, because as much as we all want all of our students back in all of the time, and I will tell you, as a teacher, it was the best day I've had in over a year to have all 18 of my kids in front of me and not turn on Zoom one time and none of them touched an iPad and it was fantastic. But like that didn't happen overnight. They had to move wires and boards and, you know, I mean, get desks, these things that aren't as easy as they sound. So I just, I, I don't want to put the cart before the horse, even though I want to have to be ready for us to go. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Lots of barriers. Dick, you had a, your hand up. Yeah, I was uh, born and raised in New York. In fact, I my mom still resides there. So I know a little bit about the, uh, a little bit more than I really want to about New York politics. And uh, I believe the New York governor was given emergency powers, which I believe the assembly in Albany, they're talking about taking back those powers this week. In fact, the word impeachment has actually come up as well based on the kinds of uh, notions that he had about putting COVID patients in nursing homes. But that's not my question. My question is, does Charlie Baker have emergency powers or is he merely a megaphone for other people who are pulling the strings? I've been confused about who has been shutting down the state of Massachusetts uh, since the middle of March. Was it Charlie Baker with uh, uh, emergency powers or is it the Department of Public Health? And who's running the Department of Public Health? Is there one person that has made all of these decisions for us? That's question number one. I'll wait on two. I don't know if that's a question that Justin is, <laughs> can answer, Dick. I don't know if that's possible. I mean, who Does Charlie Baker have emergency powers during the pandemic to come up with all the rules and regulations that he has, or is someone else pulling the strings? Now, Governor Cuomo, pulled all the strings because he had that power, which he may lose this week. I don't know. Uh, you know Mr. Hodges, I, I could not answer that question. Uh, to this point, everything that's come out has been, this is what's going to happen, but we're going to leave it up to the local decision. So it's, uh, I, I, don't, I honestly don't know the answer to that question. All right, let me go on to the second one. Uh, the, the other thing that's happened in New York is they have decided not to test students this year. And I'm wondering if uh, there's any interest on our school committee. We have nine members. 
Is there anyone interested in looking for a waiver on MCAS other than Mr. Hodges? Uh, uh, on this Nick, can I just, um, right now that is not what we're talking about. So I don't well, It's think... actually connected to the COVID because the reason they're not doing the testing is because of the uh, COVID uh, restrictions. So I thought yeah, it I, was I, connected. I... I I agree with you completely, actually. But this it's, it's we can't. I I don't believe we're discussing. We can't discuss that right now. It, we are discussing just our school, and you know, COVID and our plan to come back. But all right, write it down in your notebook. I'll bring it up again. That is definitely something we will be discussing soon. Thanks, Dina. Yep. Chris Redding, you have a question. Um, I actually have four questions. I'll do them one at a time, if that's okay. Um, well, let's do all four at the same time. Well, I'm going to do one and he can answer. And I'm <laughs> going um, so given, given the, the information that we pulled last year, and I think you spoke to it a few times here, like, can we immediately right now open schools at six feet distance? And if we can, why isn't that part of our plan to do? Well, we cannot. Well, so at six feet, we, we do not have the capacity. Let me see if I got these numbers right, right? the percentages uh, at six feet Bagnell is somewhere around 61 percent is their maximum capacity uh page completely different building is somewhere around 90 something right around 90 percent capacity uh do we combine merrimack i can't remember we combine merrimack so merrimack combined is around 74 75 right and that's at every single possible seat being filled and there is a complexity with that as well. One of the complexities with having every seat filled, you also have 250 students who are fully remote. So when they try to come back in, there's no space, they're blocked. Um, so that's just one more thing that we're trying to figure out. How do you, when you fill a, if you fill, I keep on saying second grade, if I fill a second grade classroom with 14, is that's maximum 14 people are in, a student whose teacher is that teacher. That, that teacher is that student's teacher. That student wants to come off the remote and into back in the classroom. They're blocked. Like there is no space there. So that's something we're trying to troubleshoot right now. All right, you go back and say, okay, one of the students who's in there four days has to reduce down to three. So that student can have uh, one day or two days, or, or do we offer out section M? As we said to the, Mr. Hodges mentioned, does the governor have authority? Well, I have section M. And I do have the ability to place a student possibly in another, that I can offer the student another space in another school if there might be seats available. Um, but yeah, that, that, that's, that's step one that we're in right now, is to maximize the number of seats that are occupied at six feet. Um, so, so then that leads into another question I had, which is, you know, like I understand that you had some data points to use to bring those students back, but I'm questioning whether some of the data that could be out there that isn't necessarily visible, like the psychological impact, you know, you might have like an A student who's getting C's, but you might have a C student who just is getting D's. So that won't be that big of a dis difference, but what's happening with those two students is one just completely not LinkedIn, not doing anything, and they're the ones who might need to get back in because they're just shut down. Yeah, so, so it's two, 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 one is the data. Right. The second part is when you're sitting down having a conversation with the teacher, the classroom teacher about, hey, here, here's these kids and there's a whole the list of all students who aren't there. That teacher might identify and, and more likely than not, the counselors because the student support teams might have already, here's a, here's a student that we, might be performing extremely well, but it needs to be with us, like they have to see us. So that can be a decision that they make at that school to say, yep, that, that student has to come in. But could they? You're asking, so if you're asking right. to prioritize this student or this student, I can't answer that question because I don't know who those students are or what the situation But I guess the, the question becomes, how are those students identified? And truthfully, you know, I don't think most of the teachers know the kids really well because they haven't had that time and they've had so many other responsibilities that they're doing. And I'm not, I'm not saying that they should, but they've got, like, like one person said in public comment, like they've been in school 40 out of the 100 days. So like you don't get to develop that kind of relationship that you might to pick up on those issues. So, you know, is that something that our parents reaching out to the administrators or the teachers saying, you know, I'm really having trouble with my students. Do the parents even know where to get that information? So I, think that, like I think that could be a starting point. 
I will say, if, if we say, yep, that's what we're going to do with parents' contact, every parent's going to contact. Right. They're going to say, oh, my, my child needs to be in there because of X, Y, Z. And, and it's probably true. It's the point. The problem is, what's the point of relativity? Your child compared to this child compared to this child. There is no, it's what you're seeing in front of you. It's what the teacher is seeing in front of them when the students are there. So we have to go with the information we have in front of us. So from a data perspective, uh, we have mid-year data meetings at each of the schools, and we talk about the students from a literacy perspective, math perspective as well. But I'll actually, I'll disagree with you. Teachers do know this. Because in those conversations, the data is a key point, but the dialogue often centers around what else does the teacher know about the students. And I think you'd be surprised at the insights that the teachers have from the kids. I think they've been trying to pay attention to a lot of those issues. Um, most of that work that I'm discussing has really been at the elementary level. So I, I, your experiences at the high school, our, our challenges at the high school, we have less capacity to add the kids in the same way. Uh, it's a little bit more challenging uh, to do that, not from a data perspective or priority perspective, but more from the other. Right. Well, and, and I think. When, as you were talking, I'm like, our lenses are completely different in the way that I'm seeing the struggles that high school kids have. And, you know, some high school teachers have 120 kids or however many students, and they just don't have that depth of really knowing to the students. And I think that's where the parents pull away, too, so they don't have that day-to-day. -day. Like, all of a sudden, I have a few friends who are like, my kid's failing three of the classes. Like, didn't even, wasn't aware of that because, you know, they're, they're not necessarily, you know, that tied in at this point in time. Um, so my third question is, one of the things that the, um, the governor, I think it was the governor today, said, you know, one of the reasons we can get back in is because of the pool testing that we're doing and the state gave us all these ventilation, ventilation units and purifiers. So my question is, are we doing pool testing? I know that we did that, uh, whatever the name is. Um, like, is that actually going on and how much can that cover us as we get back in? And then, how are we like across the districts with the buildings? Like, are the rooms all have the proper? I know you throw a window open, but okay, it's pouring rain or whatever, you can't throw the window open. Yeah. So we'll start with testing. So yes, we have Binax. You know, we have Binax, so if there's a suspect, there's a positive case, we can test. 15 minutes later, we have the result. Pool testing, we are, are waiting on. We are we put in our interest. We have it to March 28th. We're on hold right now because the cost of that is excessive. Mm -hmm. The state says they'll cover it. Uh, cost to us, Greg. I, I know I showed this in one of the. I, oh, I, I might be able to pull like it. I think thirty thousand after the first initial. It's 60, 000 sixty thousand the every round. three weeks or something like that yeah. is what it would cost us to do the field testing. And the reason is, as a small regional district, we do not have personnel around to help monitor the testing, to organize the testing, to take the testing there, or to inform. So, in a lot of districts, they'll use the nurses that will go around from a, to a classroom. They'll swab, and then they'll put it back. They'll take it. Um, you need someone to enter in all the data about who that swab, and all that has to go in. Um, and it's, I think it was like an additional five or six people uh, that most districts were employing or, or using that they already had. And we're a small, it's a small district. So we, don't, we don't have a central office like most districts. Even at our size, we have a much smaller central office. So we just don't have personnel in place to, to handle it. Um, but it is that financial part of it. Uh, as well, this first six weeks, I think it was still 29. There's 30,000. 30, about 30,000 is what it would cost us for six, for the first six weeks. The governor presents this, the commission presents this as we'll cover all, we'll cover the cost, so it's free to the. It's not. They cover the testing at the center, they cover the transport to the testing center, and they provide you with the supplies. And that's only for the first four weeks, right, Justin? Yeah, uh, yes, it's, uh, I think it's the first six weeks. Yeah. Six, I think it's for six weeks, but we are responsible still. I'm sorry, and they'll provide customer service, not customer service to the people being tested, but customer service to the school district, so that person can communicate with uh, with them about any issues they may be having. You still have to provide the people doing the swabbing, doing the phone calling, communicating out, collecting all the uh, consent forms. You have to do all of that, and, and, and right now. Less so now, thankfully, um, but our nurses, when, when this first came up, were over their eyeballs helping out the towns on making the calls, trying to get uh, close contact information, getting all that data.
done just so we knew what we had in our schools. Um, so that those are the big issues with pool testing. So what we're doing is waiting to see what is, what is it that these other districts will do. By the way, this is very important. You'll hear, um, the, certainly the governor said this today, the commissioner did as well, about this the federal money that's come in to help pay for this testing, right? How much of that federal money do we have left? None. Thank you. So our federal money has been spent like anything else. They said they've given us federal money to, to use um, for PPE, for additional personnel, and all those other pieces. It doesn't exist. Uh, even our ESSER 2 funds, as we talked about last meeting, is pretty much already or is already spent. Uh, so th those are the big obstacles. So you have the Binax is still, but it, it's interesting. The Binax, if there's a positive in a pool, the Binax is the test that goes to it. We are doing those. Um, as of, I think the, one of the last means of, we've tested more than this, but we had our first 10 tests. We, we had done all of them were negative. Uh, they still need to go get the PCR, but it was nice to have that right there. And it still is nice to have that um, test ability. Here, I, I, for the life of me, with all this federal money coming into the state, I don't know why the state would charge us and not just pay for the whole thing, uh, since it is a priority that would seem to me. The state hasn't spent nearly all their money at all. They spent less than half of yeah, it. Right. So, but, but I, I'm not, I'm not going to put out that little bit. Just, uh, yeah, there are five ventilation. Oh, sorry, yes, in the classrooms. <laughs> but, um, so inside the classrooms, so the state did not provide us with any of this stuff. We went out and got it ourselves. Um, sorry, sorry, thank you. Oh my goodness. At the we, so I'm gonna say, I'm gonna, we went out and got it ourselves because we worked with our towns. And the, with the towns, we were able to get the technology that uh, Emily mentioned earlier that's needed in the classrooms. We were able to get that. We were able to get air scrubbers in every single classroom. We were able to get replacement filters or several replacement filters for every single classroom. So in terms of the air, and we've done everything we can uh, to make the air quality as good as it possibly can be. So that um, wouldn't be an obstacle to that would that would not be an obstacle. Um, so my final Lisa. Oh, I had, that was that sorry. Was I, great. Oh, I thought that was your fourth question. <laughs> so, working on this plan, I think that's you know last summer when you did this um, the, the work that you did in the summer it was very collaborative. It was administration. You had parents come in and help. You had teachers involved. Like at this point. You know, I think people are frustrated. Why don't we have a plan? When is the plan going to come out? Like, like I think people need, and I'm not throwing so this on you, I'm sorry, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask this question. I'm asking what so, people so, are asking. That, like, so let me push back and ask this question. What is it that you'd be looking for? So we heard something about a date. I, I'm not going to put a date down on a piece of paper. Someone wants a date. I, I can't do that because I'm not going to put a false promise out on a piece of paper that says, yeah, hey, March. March 17th, St. Patrick's Day, we're gonna have students come back and vote. Because when, if that doesn't happen, all it's going to, we're gonna have a, 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 just a firestorm of parents that are upset because they planned based on March 17th. And we could say, we could say, yep, yeah, it's gonna be March 17th. But, but how, how do we know? Like there's no way for us to know what that date's going to be. So but I, I, I guess my question is, what is the plan that someone's looking for like well, but I, I think part of the plan and i think it's the way that you looked at it last summer is what are we looking at? what are the spaces look at what are our obstacles how can we be creative like i think having more people involved in that and that's teachers in other districts we've had a few people tonight who said you know we're working in other districts and, and they've come up with plans that work i the word plan is not appropriate but um they've come up with ideas that will help get over some of those obstacles. So I like what I would like to see is, you know, here's our list of obstacles. The pool testing to me is one. How are we going to get over that? We need to like get our leg leg legislatures involved to lobby the state and say that should be part of what you're giving us. Because they can't just say open the school and then we're kind of left, you know, I know they can, but, <laughs> yeah, but my point is, is that we as a district need to look at what are our obstacles and how are we going to overcome that? So, I think we. And that's right. part of the plan, in my opinion. So, you just want us to list down the obstacles in a paragraph, say, these are our obstacles. Well, but here's then, how we're going to deal with them. So, so yeah. we here, here's an example. So, this is all the data. So, all the administrators went through, measured every single distance three, four, five, six feet. This is how many, and these are different classrooms. Uh, this happens to be a middle school, but you can click on you can click on any of the other schools, and it has classrooms. This is how many people they can fit. In all their spaces so we know this information 
finished. So if they drop a number, we know how many people we can add in. And the principals know, okay, well, there's how many students are in that class. So here's who we can bring back. Uh, in terms of transportation, that's off the table. In terms of lunch, that's off the table. I don't know that we're going to go start buying tents right now for a date that we don't know that's going to happen. I think if, if they say that this is going to happen, this is what's going to take place, then we might go out and say, hey, we need to go ahead and make these tents. I don't think that testing, pool testing, is something that's necessary. When we brought that, I brought that up, pool testing um, with our public health nurse um, and, and we had a discussion with uh, health agents. There's not really a, a benefit. Uh, the numbers come back so low that you just you don't know. So I don't think that testing, pool testing, is, a, is an obstacle at all. So uh, I see Emily's hand up, and I know Lisa had a question uh, earlier on. I don't know if it's okay. So Lisa, then Emily. Okay, so I had two questions. Um, Justin already answered one actually just now about um, bringing in like heated tents. Um, you know, because it's like you can't get full amount of kids in the classroom you know maybe we could bring in the tents um and my second question was i know that we've already started to bring some of the kids back after February vacation to a four-day school week um somebody's phone keeps ringing um yeah, it's mine i'm ignoring it so my question is um what kind of data is being collected um, in order to bring these kids back. I mean, we're not doing MCAS, so it's not MCAS scores. Is there form of testing that's being done, plus observation, plus test scores and quiz scores and classroom assignments? Like, what is being included here in this data when the kids back up four days a week? Yeah, so on our kindergarten through eighth grade, there's diagnostic assessments that are done. They're done three times a year. Um, and then that's the well, I'm pretty sure that's the maximum you're supposed to give a diagnostic assessment. But basically, what you're looking for is there's an initial data point. A student, as they continue on, they should be at a certain slope. And based on where they do their second assessment, you can see the increase or decrease or where they're, where they're supposed to be at given their growth curve. Uh, I can give you, I can turn over to Mr. Conley, he can give you the very specifics. But to give very specifics, he's going to tell you that what's at kindergarten for diagnostics is different than what's at third grade for diagnostics um, because the Kindergarten, you're, you're trying to learn just the letters, identify your letters. Uh, <coughs> you think you want to? Sure. Yeah, I mean, there's screening assessments. We've discussed them before uh, literacy and math, um, kindergarten through grade eight. Um, you know, and they change as you, you go up the ladder a little bit. So, those are the assessments and the data we use. And basically, we went through by grade level and, and identified the students who. Have been struggling, um, and if they weren't in school already four or five days a week, uh, those are the students we, we sort of flag for uh, consideration to, to move in for four or five days a week. And that process started uh, about a week and a half ago before vacation. And then this week, those students, some of them started to come in, some of them will, will yeah, next week. That was a week and a half before vacation, or a week and a half, yeah. a week and a half ago, or a week and a half before vacation. So basically, at the end of January, we started to identify. Okay, these are the kids. Let's start. Let's start organizing this, and and based on space availability, prioritizing uh, those students based on their performance, um, and, and comparing not just the data point to you know the teacher's input as well. So the data was the starting point for the conversation, and then the teacher's input on uh, how well they were doing, or were there other students who did okay data wise? However, we knew we were having a difficult time. Uh, and that's how we begin that process. Uh, and, and we've added, um, it'll be by the end of next week, it'll be nearly 300 additional students who will be in four or five days a week. You said 45. All right, Emily. <laughs> so I. I saw the spreadsheet that you showed about capacity at different amounts, a different feet, amount of feet. Um, so how many classes would that actually mean couldn't fit in the space they are currently assigned to at a six foot distance? So at six feet, I do not believe, aside from our district programs, I do not believe there's a single, oh, sorry, that's not true. Not true. Um, there are several classes at that 
page where we are able to fit. I think most, if not all, the students. Again, that, that number is it's hard. It's, so the reason why I can't say, yes, this is exactly the number is because we also have those remote students who are sitting out there. And if they come back, that, that throws things. Right. So I guess my question is, is that something that we can figure out? Because, like, you know, the specialists are coming into the classrooms. So bigger rooms like the libraries, the art rooms um, might be available for a classroom. So you second grade, right? If you've got a bigger second grade, then you have another grade. Like maybe you can fit three groups of 16 in their classrooms and then you have a bigger class so a class of like 22 that could fit in the library space but they could still be the whole class in the building um so i, I guess i'm wondering that's what i mean by like how many classes literally not like percentage wise but even if you just looked at you know k to two three to five, whatever grade span you wanted, I would start with the little kids, but I'm biased. Um, so like how many actual people, like how many people would not fit in their classroom with the whole class as we know it currently? So, so what we actually have one of our building principals working on that very problem right now. Um, and in order to do that, they're looking at alternative spaces, which you know, we've said we'll, we'll use just about anything. Um, the most challenging of all of our schools is high school, because it's the largest number of students, it's the smallest, the smallest class size is next to Bag Now. Um, so when you we use Bag Now to talk about elementary, those are small class numbers. I'm sorry, small, physically small class numbers. Um, so they cannot, I don't think there's a aside from this report, it's not a single class, but they can have them all in the same page. As opposed to page, we can, the majority of those classes, because other than maybe moving one or two, just as you spoke about. Uh, but we, so that analysis of using additional spaces, that's been done. And we've incorporated that into what we can do for capacity. And that's how we're adding students in right now. Does anyone else have a, I, I, is Marie raising her hand? Yes. I can't see Marie. I can only see Chris and Chris. <laughs> so while we always form most of the students in class, we have to take a district-wide approach. I think the next question from a lot of parents is going to be, are you willing to send page kids back, but not bang up? Are you willing to send suits of kids back, but not done to? Or is it going to be a district-wide when everyone can go, will go? Yeah, great question. So the answer is one. Could you repeat that, Justin? I couldn't, we couldn't hear it. So, Reese uh, Belzani's question was, uh, one of the questions we can reasonably anticipate is, when we say that Bagnell has a capacity of just around just over 60%, and Page has a capacity over 90%, are we prepared to say, hey, we're going to fill, so if you, you live in West Newry, you have an elementary student, you're more likely to be able to go to school, in some cases five days, than a Bagnell student who's not going to have that opportunity because their buildings are small. And the answer to the question is yes. Uh, we, we're not going to penalize. If we have the space to fill for students, then we're going to fill the space. We don't get to control the physical size of the classroom. Um, it's it, it, that, that we're working with the space that we have. So yes, we, we are we are moving forward. I mean, the the, the, the idea of um, saying to a child that they have to stay home because even though there's empty seats, because in that other town, they don't have the empty seats, and that's just, it's just not appropriate, especially, especially because right now, we're making these decisions based on data. So we have identified students who we know need to be there. So we're facing this already. Yeah. And Mr. Gray has spent the last few days on the phone. This is all he's doing is calling these families and bringing them in. Most of those grade levels, he's doing it full, it's not even a prioritization because they can do just that, right? Uh, there are grade levels though, where it's not so easy. There are some configuration changes. So that's gonna be sort of phased in, whether it's next week, the week after, because we have to work around them. So little by little, over the next two or three weeks, Paige will basically get to the point where they'll only be a full percent. 100% of their students who wanna begin will be there. Uh, two grade levels have some hurdles, but you know, 
primarily, uh, they'll, they'll be able to do that. And the other buildings have, have spacing issues that, that prevent that. Does anyone else have anything to add? Wayne? No. Okay. Thank you. Uh, one quick follow up. I was just going to offer, I, I mean, I think primarily our, our, our hurdles are the lunches are a big hurdle. Like that's that's a big hurdle for us to work around. Uh, finding ways to do that. Um, and, and it's a matter of spacing and supervision, right? Because that needs to be six feet. Unless that changes. Unless that changes. The other hurdle is if we fill all these and then we have students asking to now come back in after being remote, we don't have space for them. Uh, we don't have to respond to them immediately. They can wait for, for several weeks, but space isn't going to open up either. So that is something that we, we, we're going to close the gate and we may not be able to reopen it. That's the problem. With that. so we, we, and those are probably our two major hurdles. Everything else is a, is a you know, if we're going to go down to three feet, Everything else is a logistical component that we can work with, and we'll be pretty close. So I, I, I would say, Emily mentioned this as well. If area furniture is its mission, um, because we need to reconfigure all the classrooms, um, and those classrooms have to be set up a completely different way than what they were initially. I did have a question. I know it's not my turn to ask questions, but Ms. Wire, since, since you brought this up, I was curious to, to know uh, when you went through that transition. Were you still teaching while the transition was happening? No. So our school committee made the decision on a Tuesday. We had, I think, like a week to, like, get our heads in line. And then basically the Friday before vacation. Um, so we are, when my, in our district, we don't teach, a, so we don't have asynchronous days. We have all of our kids all the time, just half of them on a screen and half of them in front of us. So um, the Friday before vacation and yes, is it just Tuesday? And yesterday um, we were allowed to give them fully asynchronous work, like what the Pentucket kids get on Monday. Um, so no live anything. Um, and we basically spent Friday as a moving day, like physical, moving the desks that we had and having the janitors move um, desks. Yep. We're lucky because one of our elementary schools is getting rebuilt, so they had extra desks <laughs> that we could use. So we spent one day kind of dealing with the physical plant and um, moving like the active boards so that they could be seen in the new arrangement and that kind of thing. And then um, today kind of finalizing and, or sorry, yesterday finalizing and figuring out like how to teach in this way when you don't have all your kids on a screen much anymore, um, except for we have a couple fully remote kids. So um, you, had, you had the Friday and Monday and during February, during February break. Monday. But the Friday before and the Monday right after um, February break were our like physical plant days, um, not including the technology. The technology people came in after school, um, like the Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, right before February vacation to like rewire things and, you know, do their tech magic. Chris Markins, you've had your hand up. I'm sorry. Did I get oh, sorry, sorry. That, and I think we're all uh, getting ready to maybe move on, but I just wanted to very quickly First of all, I acknowledge Emily's point that it's gonna be incredibly important for people to remember as we move forward on whatever happens when we move forward, that this stuff um, is not, as I think Dr. B has said a number of times, it is not snap your finger stuff. It is complicated stuff that takes time and it takes a thoughtful rollout. And, and it's, so we didn't transition here very quickly. We're not gonna transition out of it immediately. It's going to be very difficult. Um, I for one am pretty encouraged uh, from what they've said so far tonight, it sounds like, a lot of the planning that has happened um, over the past year is ready to be implemented with adjustments. Um, if you know we ultimately make the change that the state is talking about today, it sounds like we're in a pretty good place to do that uh, fairly quickly. Um, and again, I think you really have to acknowledge it's not easy to have a job where you wake up in the morning and then somebody goes on TV and says some magic words and everything is suddenly very, very different than it was five minutes ago. It, you know, it, a 
affecting thousands of people and hundreds of employees and, and all of your decisions. So that that said, I'm just going <laughs> to, my own thinking on this right now is we look forward a little bit because my own sense is that we're heading towards a place where sometime in April, the state is going to expect that we have a plan, plan right. for elementary kids right. all to be back at whatever space we can manage, but that the fixation on magic numbers is maybe not going to be there like it is right now. And <laughs> we ultimately are an educational governance body. And the agency that oversees education in the state of Massachusetts is going to be saying to us, we think science is on our side. We think it's time to move forward like this. And we're going to have a decision to make. And if another body ultimately uses its appropriate authority to say something different, that's one thing. But um, I think we're going to have to start thinking about those things very seriously. So, so I think that it's, it's a great point. Remember, we, we've had this where, even with athletics, we approved that athletics that still had to go um, for improvement. And Mr. Marcus is saying what he said, uh, obviously experience, certainly you're watching. Uh, what he's referencing is every time a statement like this comes up, inevitably as a school district, we are set to survey for required to submit uh, how we're going to make this work. Uh, so that's what we would fully expect after the state board, if they approve the commissioner's plan, we fully expect within the next week after we receive the guidance, which who knows when that would come. Um, we would expect within a week after we get the guidance that they're going to say, here's a link where you need to upload from X, Y, or Z. You need your school committee's approval or just submit us how you know to get this done. Um, that's so far been there for us up around. Emily? Uh, so to sort of get back on what Chris was saying, I wonder if we might even start small with some of this, like looking about how could we get all the kindergartners back in or all the kindergartners and first graders back in before we have to expand it exponentially. Um, so just something to think about. Chris Redding. Well, and I think, you know, one of the things I think was said today was that, you know, each of the districts should be surveying the families to see there may be a group of people who don't want their children back in, who even were there to begin with, but now without the same social, they want them completely remote. Um, so I think being able to have everything that we're going to need ready to go, I think makes the most sense. So figure out like, um, you know, what are the populations we're talking about and figure out which classrooms have the obstacles. And like, it sounds like Paige is really trying to do that. And, you know, to do that across the district. I think that's what people need to see. They need to see that things are moving. They need to see that these are being thought about. Um, we all know it's it's been happening, but I think the view from the people who are at home, they don't see this happening. You know, they, they don't see the information. They don't see the, the work going on. So I think that's where the frustration of the community is right now. Um, I even say at the school committee level, like there's a lot of information we shared tonight that kind of wish I had known about. And, you know, the surveys of the different classrooms and the capacities, like that should be maybe some public information so that people. Um, I feel like we have known about that stuff, though. Like, I think he's gone. Uh, I mean, we've gone over that, I believe, but. Well, but in general, but not the specifics of it. And I think when you add the specifics of it, you know, that that helps people understand, you know, like Tritown, the Masco Elementary Group, they've been in from the beginning. Yeah, because they had the space from the start. Like, we right. know we have the space, but I think, why don't we have the space? Where are the problems? Like, if you haven't stepped foot in the high school, you don't understand that some of the classrooms have fixed labs. You know, so that alone creates a problem. So I think the more information that we can get about what we're dealing with so that people can understand the problem solving that needs to take place. So, so I, I think one of the pieces that we were actually going to post on today, but we did not as soon as the commissioner made his announcement, was a page of frequently asked questions. So what are the questions that come up most often? Uh, and then we have responses. So there at the time, I think we have six or seven. And I actually shared that document <laughs> to the local health agents, um, the people that are in those meetings, because as we know, they've been getting phone calls and people are asking them questions. So I asked them to write down what, what they typically hear or questions. 
Uh, of course, as soon as we got today's information, that opened up a whole other set of questions. Um, so, you know, we, we, I think when we have frequently asked questions, people want to know um, how do you decide how many kids can be at six feet versus three? What do you what do you for capacity? Um, and those, those are things we did before, we can do it again, we can just put them up, we can write good questions, and we can put that in that big queue. I think that the survey thing, absolutely. In fact, I think we know very confidently, Mr. Conway, that there's at least one school district that has done this and just asked the question, if we're able to drop down to three feet, would you still be willing to have your children go to school? And 20% of that population that was already going to school in the hybrid said no. Um, so that again impacts numbers and that impacts planning. Um, so there, there are all, all sorts of variables. But I, you know, I'm for a survey, easy, that's a quick, easy survey. Even if we don't get every bit of response, we just need an idea. Um, but that's something once we have the guidelines come from this, we'll know what to put in for that distance and what to say to parents uh, in a survey type of yeah, Obviously, data like that is critically important to us getting our numbers uh, for classroom spaces and for cost spaces. Okay, are we? Are, I think we've exhausted this discussion. You Is there anything you're wrong? <laughs> one, one more quick thing. I very quickly, I did want to point out um, because it's come up a couple times tonight. I think both in public comment, and I know I've heard it a lot from other people just out in the community. Um, I completely get the temptation to compare uh, the districts to other districts and other communities. It's a totally natural human thing to do. I find myself doing it, um, but I'm. I'm and I, I'm gonna remind people, uh, we're a very unique community. Every community is, when you see Braintree in the news, you're seeing the news partly because it's newsworthy that a district is going back full in person. It's still pretty darn rare. And secondly, you know, Braintree is two and a half times the enrollment and twice as many school buildings has been taught. But the, the, the differences are just exponential in terms of the planning that happens. So continue to go to the Kentucky website, continue to watch the meetings, continue to reach out to us. But I'm gonna encourage everybody to focus on Pentucket and not so much on Haverhill or Braintree or the other places that you see in the news. Thank you, Chris, I agree. <laughs> okay, can we, we will move on to our last, I don't even know where it is. Our last item on the agenda is the fiscal year 22-23 proposed calendar and 22, wait, I'm sorry, 22-23. Brent, did you want to talk about this? Sure. Um, we don't often come to you with calendars for two years, um, but it was purposeful. Uh, we do tonight, just even before I begin, we seek a vote uh, on calendar for FY22, which is next school year. Uh, we are not seeking to vote for, for FY23. However, we presented to you for context of the discussion around the calendar. Um, we, this is actually an exciting thing. Um, so the reason is, as we prepare, next year is the last year in the school buildings, in this building and the high school. So next year is the last year around that. We have a period of time from the end of school next year, so again, yeah, not this June, the following June, where we have the last day of school in that building and people need to get out <laughs> and, and they can't leave anything behind, otherwise it's not, not coming with them. Uh, and we can prepare to move into the new building at the close of next school year. We need the summer to be as long as possible without it having a, a true negative impact on, on student learning. We don't want to do that. Um, but we want to give our um, our contractors and, and the work that needs to be done in order to take down and de demolish these buildings, particularly the building next door. So just in the term time frame, uh, it's estimated it's four weeks for abatement. Um, anybody who took a tour of these buildings will tell you that uh, 19, 50s and 60s were the decades of asbestos. Um, so it's the maybe four weeks of abatement followed by about four weeks of demolition. Um, so it, that's the reason for the longer summer. So we have a buffer in there to make sure those can take place so that we can return 
uh, execute a full 118 days. So we, we were seeking a minimum of eight weeks. We wanted to build as much of a cushion as possible. Um, so what we do is we're proposing a calendar for next year, uh, FY22, that starts a little earlier than what we would typically start. Uh, it has the teachers doing uh, three professional development days on the 25th, 26th, and 27th. Uh, and then the students coming to school on uh, August 30th uh, would be their first day for school. Um, and, and then we would get out on the 10th or the 185th day would be the 17th of June. Uh, so next we are does not present as, as many problems other than that we'd be starting a little bit earlier in uh, August than we might get to do. Uh, most of the other things are fairly consistent. Um, you know, we had dialogue around early release date on those Fridays. We'd like to have those return next year. That's our intention. Um, we back them up to vacation weeks. Uh, that's based on data. Yeah, based on data. Uh, I know there's been discussions for the amount of people who don't like that and want them on a Wednesday. If they don't like the Fridays, it's, it's the same in reverse. So people want them on the Friday. So, and I believe we had a pie chart on that. Show yeah, like a lot of yep. um, and that's pretty much where it all falls um, for, for FY22. I present to you the FY23 so you see the impact on what it does for calendar of what we're trying to accomplish as well, so that we would start a little bit later. Um, certainly, there can be adjustments made in FY23. We'll be speaking next year about this time uh, for FY23 uh, and what that calendar looks like. Um, but you know, I also gave you a summary of proposed calendar notes. We did uh, bring this to PAT leadership and they discussed it as well uh, and gave us a little bit of feedback on some things and we were able to incorporate some of that into, into the calendar. Emily, you have your hand up. Um, so I know that this is a negotiated item, but I I'm going to bring it up again anyway. Um, I We've been asking for a couple of years about the idea of a second parent conference um, in sometime later in the year, because for most parents, especially of primary kids, to have one for sure opportunity to be face to face with your child's teacher um, and when it's only 10 minutes long doesn't really feel like a lot. Um, so I would like to put that back out at, I guess, the negotiating team, as well as you with the calendar to see um, if that could be addressed finally. So we, we, you'll note actually in the calendar brought to you, there's a sort of a placeholder for parent teacher conferences. And actually on this calendar, it is earlier than what we typically do. However, um, I, I do some teacher approval knowing that we might have to change how we're going to do parent teacher conferences. It may not be in that date in October, it might change, uh, and there may be additional dates. Those are things that are negotiable items. Uh, PAT is interested in hearing about what different approaches. Um, you know, from our perspective, we'd actually like to distance it from the report part, uh, not have it be in the same week. Uh, and yet, there are others who, who feel like it should be around the same time. So. We have to have that dialogue, but that's that's a well, sort of we've well, we had right. We've had that dialogue, right? Right. And there was a negotiation. Right? So you well, are our position of separating from the report cards because we want the conversation to be about how the students are performing, not what that letter grade is or what the uh, what it is on the report card. Because that's that's a something thing that we need not talk about necessarily. The same well, that's part of it, but also the idea of having a date in the fall, and I do like it to be the earlier date does make sense to me personally, but also to have some kind of date in the spring. Um, and I didn't see a placeholder for that unless I'm just misreading it. So, so we didn't put a placeholder there because it is not currently a, a negotiated item. So the placeholder you see is reflective of what the negotiated item is, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's held in a different place, knowing that we're, we're trying to engage the dialogue around it. Um, but if we can add more and, and that works, then we would seek to do so. Okay, well, thank you.
Does anyone else have any questions about the calendars? Or I think this is it's a great forward thinking, Brent and Justin, just because of the new building and moving in. Um, so can I have a motion? Can I, can I add that, so the motion should be uh, relative to the 22 calendar, FY22 calendar, uh, noting that the conference, parent-teacher conferences will be- Subject to change. Yeah, and, and that doesn't impact the calendar itself. Sorry. Yeah. So, so moved. Second. <laughs> Is there any more discussion? Marianne, did you get the motion? Yes. Okay. Uh, roll call vote. Uh, Wayne. Yes. Joanna. Yes. Emily. Yes. Marie. Yes. Dick. Yes. Lisa. Yes. Chris Markins. Yes. Chris Redding. Yes. Dina. Yes. Okay, we have voted and approved both calendars. Can I have a motion? to adjourn the meeting. So moved. Second. Okay, roll call vote, Wayne? Yes. Joanna? Yes. Emily? Yes. Marie? Yes. Dick? Yes. Lisa? Yes. Chris Markins? Yes. Chris Redding? Yes. Okay, thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night.